Good evening. This June 14th, 2018 regular meeting of the Fairfax County School Board will now come to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, a moment of silence, and the performance of the national anthem by the Clearview Elementary School Strings under the direction of Allison Devereaux. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, students from Clearview. I don't know if Ms. Willison is here, our fine principal. And thank you, parents, for bringing your children this evening and sharing their musical talents with us. Thank you. In order to comply with Section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia, it is necessary for the Board to certify that since the Fairfax County School Board convened a closed meeting on June 14, 2018, to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the Board during the closed meeting. Is there a motion? Moved by Ms. Evans, seconded by Mr. McElveen. All those in favor? That motion is unanimous? Yes. Thank you very much. With Mr. Wilson away from the table. A few other announcements before we begin tonight's meeting. If you would like to review a copy of the agenda in any agenda item that is being discussed tonight, that information is on the table by the auditorium entrance. Tonight's agenda is available by going to the school board on the FCPS homepage and selecting board docs under upcoming school board meetings. The meeting is also being streamed live online. Select the school board from the full menu, then click on the watch live button on the school board meeting website. Please turn off or silence your cell phone. Recognition of the 2018 School Board Character Award recipient. I will call on Ms. Derenak Kofax. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, accepting the award this evening on behalf of this year's recipient of the 2018 School Board Character, Rabia Saad, is Erin Crawley, who's the Director of Student Services at Hayfield Secondary School. So the School Board Character Award was initiated by former student representative to the School Board, Chris Giovarelli, and he established the Student Advisory Council in 2001. The April Federal Credit Union Education Foundation has generously funded the $500 award since 2007. And this award is given to a junior or senior who demonstrates a continuous record of high morals strong integrity and good character, and who is recognized as a role model for students in Fairfax Public, 
Fairfax County Public Schools in their day-to-day -day behavior. The recipient of the 2018 School Board Character Award is Rabia Saad, a senior at Hayfield, Elementary, Hayfield Secondary School. Rabia is a tremendous source of hope and inspiration for the Hayfield community. She shares heartfelt compassion and empathy with her peers, serving as a listening ear, guiding them to available resources and counseling, and working to guarantee a safe place for students to come. Her passion is making people feel acknowledged and understood. According to one teacher, to put it simply, she cares. She is consistently there for anyone who needs emotional help. Her warm persona brightens the day for everyone who comes into contact with her within the school. With great dedication and a caring heart, volunteer service is very important to Rabia. Since her freshman year, she has volunteered on weekends with Give tutoring, helping children of all races, religions, and abilities on a variety of subjects, and learning the impact of friendship in shaping future leaders. She is very involved and engaged in Hayfield activities, encouraging STEM act academics with the Technology Student Association, supporting the arts and creativity as a member of the National Honor Society, and advocating for her peers through the student government. Rabia is dedicated to promoting equity and acceptance with the Muslim Youth Club. She has helped educate students and advance cultural awareness for Islam in today's society. She is trustworthy and responsible, and she serves as emotional support for her peers, helping them overcome challenges. As one of her nominators said, she inspires everyone around her to become a better person and to give back to her world. Her strength and influence reveal character traits all of our students should be inspired by. Rabia has earned this and is truly deserving of the School Board Character Award. Please join me in welcoming Aaron Crawley to the dais for a photo with the board. Next, I will call on Ms. McLaughlin for a resolution honoring the 2018 Laura Ashley Piper Scholarship Award recipient. Before I begin, I would like to invite Hannah Catherine McHale to please come to the podium. Laura Ashley Piper served as a student representative to the Fairfax County School Board from 1986 to 1987. This outstanding student, talented athlete, exceptional leader, graduated from Robinson Secondary School and the Air Force Academy and was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Air Force. She was killed in action over northern Iraq in April of 1994. To honor Laura Ashley Piper's strong commitment to student participation and to recognize her high standards of achievement and involvement and her willingness to continually accept responsibility throughout her lifetime, the School Board of Fairfax County established the annual $1,000 Laura Ashley Piper Scholarship. In 2007, Apple Federal Credit Union Educational Fund began its endowment of the Laura Ashley Piper Scholarship, providing the $1,000 annually. We appreciate their continued generosity. Each year, Every high school may nominate one senior 
a student who exemplifies the attributes of personal excellence and commitment to student government that represented Lieutenant Piper. A committee from the Office of the School Counseling Services, Department of Instructional Services, considers the nominees. There is an engraved plaque in the school board office with each winner's name. This year, the school board will recognize Hannah Catherine McHale for the, from W.T. Woodson High School, our recipient of the 2018 Laura Ashley Piper Scholarship. So now, I will read the official resolution naming Hannah Catherine McHale, the 2018 Laura Ashley Piper Scholarship recipient. Whereas, Hannah McHale has remained consistently committed to excellence in academics, athletics, and student leadership responsibilities throughout her years at W.T. Woodson High School. And whereas, Hannah has maintained a 4.37 GPA while taking challenging honors and AP courses and actively participating in various school activities, including theater, athletics, and various clubs, and for three years, Hannah has earned academic awards and is expected to receive one for her senior year. Whereas Hannah is a leader in both of her school and community, where she was the president of the National English Honor Society. In addition, she has also been a member of both the History and Spanish Honor Societies, head coach for her Fairfax Police Youth Club volleyball team, and directed a one-act play in the 2018 VHSL one act competition where she won fourth place in there in that competition and in her junior year for the history society she was the runner up for the history bowl competition and whereas hannah's commitment to others has included being president and team captain for the relay for life team where collectively they raised over one hundred thousand dollars for the american cancer society During her four years at Woodson, she has been an elementary school theater camp counselor where she helped choreograph dances, stage scenes, and costumes. She donated blood on a regular basis, and she became a certified mental health first aid where she has been able to help those in seeking professional assistance when her peers have been feeling a sense of crisis. And whereas during her time at Woodson, she has participated in volleyball, where she was recognized as the honorable all-conference player, most improved player, most valuable player, and in basketball, where she was recognized as team captain and scholar athlete. And whereas Hannah's exceptional leadership qualities, her strong communication skills, commitment to duty, and her passion and enthusiasm to help others demonstrates a maturity well beyond her years, and in every way, she personifies the characteristics and the ideals to which Laura Ashley Piper adhered to. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Fairfax County School Board awards the Laura Ashley Piper Scholarship to Hannah Catherine McHale in memory of Lieutenant Piper and in recognition of both of them for their drive, determination, and dedication to excellence. I so move. Second. Seconded by Ms. Evans. All those in favor? That motion passes unanimously. Congratulations. Madam Chair, before we take the picture, we were supposed to um, speak to our motion, so I am going to take the liberty yes, to briefly do. speak to it, only because um, I believe most of my colleagues, as well as the audience, is not aware that I have known Hannah since she was only five years old. Her, her family and my family have been very close, and by the way, I was not only not on the selection committee, I didn't even know she had applied nor, until I was given the envelope to call her and say, you are our winner. Um, but Hannah has also been my youngest son Ryan's best friend since kindergarten. And um, yesterday we celebrated both of their graduations. And uh, so Hannah's like a daughter to me. 
And when you hear what Hannah has accomplished in her time, not just at Woodson, but truly through 13 years of being a student here in Fairfax County, that she is the second generation of also Fairfax County parent graduates. Uh, she's emblematic of what makes this such an incredible school system and why we are so incredibly proud every year of our graduates um, when they do leave Fairfax County and go on to wonderful, wonderful achievements in, and represent us so well. Um, but Hannah, more than anything, I have been blessed to see what a beautiful, kind, thoughtful person you are to everyone whose lives you touch each and every day. And I can't wait to see you continue to blossom in your next four years at the University of Virginia. And, uh, you know, at this point, I, I know um, Ms. Evans will want to speak briefly because this is a very special scholarship. And then we will look forward to having a photo at the dais with all of my colleagues. Yes, thank you. And I, uh, I did read this year for the Laura Ashley Piper scholarships. I did not know Ms. McLaughlin uh, knew uh, this particular applicant, but I will say that I, I wish everyone could see the applications. They are just superb. And so, uh, of course, we were just completely blown away when we read about Hannah's accomplishments. So it's particularly um, I'm particularly honored to have been able to read the applications this year and to help choose our recipient this year, particularly when she was among such stellar applicants. So uh, congratulations, Hannah, and uh, best wishes for, for your future. I know you have an incredibly bright future. In addition to the board, we would also like to invite her family members and loved ones to join us for the picture as well. <laughs> Along with our rock and awesome principal, Carlin Floyd. Thank you, Dr. Floyd, for joining us here. And next, I will call on Mr. McLeveen to recognize our wonderful student representative. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm honored to read the resolution honoring Nirika Vatikanda, our student representative for this past year. Whereas Nirika Vatikanda, a newly graduated member of the 2018 senior class at Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology, has enthusiastically served as the 47th student representative to the Fairfax County School Board for the 2017-18 school year, and whereas Nirika believes it is important to break down the barrier between the student body and the school board to focus on the most important issues to students. 
She has successfully served as the student voice on the school board by reaching out to other students during visits to, to schools and then scare, sharing the student perspective with the school board on various issues, including equitable grading and workload to prevent undue stress for students, access to mental health programs and workshops for both students and parents to help reduce stress, and increasing access to extracurricular activities such as music and athletics. And she has attended numerous board meetings, work sessions, and even public hearings. And whereas Neureka believes in community service and has set a strong example by her involvement with Teens Transforming Technology, whereas she, she is the founder and CEO uh, that is a leading non national nonprofit to teach students, particularly girls and minorities in low-income neighborhoods about computer programming and provides access for these students to continue computer science through mentorship and more advanced programs for older students. She was selected to participate in the Stanford University She++ Pro Fellowship Program, where her initiative brought computer science access to underrepresented demographics last spring. She has also been involved with the White House United State of Women Summit, Inclusive STEM Education for Youth of Color, and many more programs. Whereas Nirika maintained personal academic excellence while enrolled, in rigorous AP courses ranging from calculus and US history to mi micro and macro economics, AP Spanish literature, computer science, and probability theory. She was actively involved in the student activities by serving as a representative of her school for the Fairfax County Student Human Rights Commission, worked as chair for the Diversity in Literature Project, where she help, helped create a countywide book group and forum in which high school students from across the county could discuss books related to themes of equality and equal opportunity. And she served as a member of the executive organizing team of Hack TJ where uh, she helped corporate sponsors engage directly with student hackers to expose students to careers in technology. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Fairfax County School Board acknowledges with gratitude the contributions and service of Niharika Vatikanda from July 1st, 2017 through June 30th, 2018. And we extend our best wishes to her on her post-secondary academic studies as she attends the Robertson Scholars Leadership Program at UNC Chapel Hill and then Duke in the fall and continued success in all her future endeavors. I so move. Seconded by Mr. Moon. Uh, all those in favor? That motion passes unanimously. Now we will share some kind words, beginning with Mr. McElveen. Niharika, I will, I will keep it short. It has been such a pleasure to get to know you, and we are all so proud of you for your successes in Fairfax County um, and uh, uh, on your future um, uh, endeavors at, um, at Chapel Hill and Duke. And so um, typically we will give you something that is living for you to take with you. In this case, it is flowers. Um, but we also want to make sure you have something that will never die because you will keep it on your dorm room and then in your home when you move uh, back to Fairfax County. Um, and that is a, uh, <laughs> it is all of us. So we hope you take, take us with you uh, and we sincerely <laughs> wish you all the best for the future. Mr. Moon. Oh, we are gonna miss you even though you were supposed to be a student voice representing 190,000 students. Whenever you spoke, you sound like a grown-up, mature voice to me, even more mature than some of us, including myself. So thank you and congratulations and wish you well. And I have one question for you. How is it possible for you to do the program at both the UNC and Duke when they are arch rivals in basketball? <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Keys Gamara. Yes, I just want to thank you for um, enhancing my first months here on the school board. I uh, really got the, the luck of the draw to be able to sit next to you and to hear your insightful comments and your care for everybody around you. And I just want you to know that you have truly, truly impressed me and encouraged uh, everyone on this board and, and everyone that you serve. And um, I've just really been impressed and it makes me feel as though um, we have, uh, we can really trust that our future will be in good hands. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Palchek. 
Thank you. As a fellow colonial, uh, I have been incredibly impressed by your um, commitment, your passion, but also your maturity uh, and your level of thought and understanding and your ability to communicate that. I'm espe especially impressed by all you've done to give back to the community, especially to girls and uh, students of color, students in low-income communities, um, to get them involved in STEM opportunities. So thank you for all you've done. Very excited to see the future. And please come back and visit us. You know how fun our meetings can be. <laughs> Ms. Hines? So, Nirika, I was mentioning earlier that you, other than our at-large board members who represent the entire county, you actually have more constituents than I do as a district board member because you speak for and represent 180, so what are we up to, 188,000 students now? Yeah, it grows every day, it seems. Um, and I have 130,000 constituents in Hunter Mill. So, and I, I would argue that your constituency is the most important one and in a lot of ways the toughest one to make sure that we hear from. So we absolutely rely on you. And uh, we have been able to rely on you for the last year. You've done a great job of keeping in touch with students, of boldly sometimes representing their feelings here at the table. You don't get to vote, but that doesn't mean that you haven't taken the opportunity to be persuasive and to advocate on behalf of the students. So you are brave, kind, hardworking, a role model in so many ways. And um, just make sure you keep in touch, okay? <laughs> Ms. Darnett Koufax? So many of these words have already been said about you, but it's been fun sitting on this end of the table with you, always getting to chat with you. A pleasure getting to know you. I really appreciate your enthusiasm, your maturity, your insights and perspectives on the many topics we, we spoke of as a board. And as uh, several of my colleagues have already noted, your maturity and insights are were phenomenal and oftentimes you spoke with such elegance it just literally took my breath away so it was just so lovely um, I am too this is the first time I'd heard about this unique opportunity for you at the Robertson Scholars Leadership Program and as Mr. Moon said um, I am very curious to see which tournament jersey you're going to be wearing at the end of this year <laughs> so best of luck and keep in touch Miss McLaughlin in addition to all the other accolades that our colleagues have shared, I really want to spotlight your commitment to student stress and mental health. Here you are, one of the finest high schools in all of the United States, extremely competitive, one committed to science, technology, and engineering, and math, and yet you have focused on the thing that I think matters the most for all 100 of our 90,000 students, which is how do you find joy in a competitive school system? How do you have that opportunity to still love learning? And the fact that you brought that voice and helped our board, our leadership team, our superintendent, all continue to understand that that is such a key component of really raising uh, our students to be the best portraits of a graduate, but ones that are happy and healthy and have an opportunity to truly succeed. So thank you for bringing that powerful voice this year. It meant a lot. Ms. Evans? Niharika, I, um, I want to go back to when we first learned that you were going to be our school board student rep. And I remember reading your resume, because it was a resume, of all of your accomplishments and then wanting to go take a nap. Because, you know, you, you had just done so much already, uh, even before your senior year. Um, and so, you know, you are very accomplished, as, as, uh, as is clear uh, from that. And, uh, you know, when we first sat down uh, last summer uh, at Starbucks and talked about your very ambitious plans, I was even more impressed with you particularly when I saw how uh, strongly you felt about, uh, as Ms. McLaughlin said, the mental health issue and the stress issue, which we, we still need to keep going on that, and I know that you'll support us from afar as we do that. Um, another one I think I, thing I wanted to highlight, and it's a little recognized or a little valued piece of what the school board student rep does, is make appointees. You have, a, you have the power to appoint to um, our advisory committees, and I think you did a particularly excellent job of finding students who would be very um, involved and very much a part of the conversation, which does make a difference. And lastly, uh, last but not least, uh, I just want to say how um, I appreciated your very clear 
and forceful views that you expressed at this board table and at our work sessions. You uh, were able to express yourself both thoughtfully and boldly, and uh, that is exactly what we need in a student rep. So um, good luck to you. I know you will do wonderful, wonderful things, and, uh, and we will miss you very, very much. So please do stop back by. Ms. Corbett Sanders? Yes, um, I echo much of what's already been said by all of my colleagues at the table, but I also want to thank you for the poise and grace in which you um, brought to this table some your views on some very difficult issues. And you challenged each and every one of us, not only at the table but in our community, to think from the eyes of a millennial, of somebody who is... Um, living in a very different world than many of us live, you know, grew up in. And so your perspective and your willingness to respectfully challenge each and every one of us to live up to being a better self as we did our board work is greatly appreciated. And we wish you well. We will cheer you on and look forward to see you, seeing you do many, many more exciting things. Ms. Schultz? So if anything, we gave you the gift of grit <laughs> um, and a training ground. There's nothing that you can't do after having accomplished what you've accomplished within Fairfax County Public Schools. But I was kind of hoping that Ms. Evans was going to bring it up. You were such a great advocate for sleep. Um, and, and a reminder, and she would get up and leave our board table and say, I've got to go home and I've got to study and I've got to go to sleep. And um, having, having, having that, that, that takes a lot of guts to say, you know what, I have the right thing I got to do and I'm going to go do it and take care of yourself. And um, that was a great model uh, to all the students who come after you. On behalf of all of us, we are very grateful to your strong and mature voice. And I think your thoughtfulness in, in getting a good sense of what the breadth and depth of the student voice throughout the county, it was very meaningful. Um, sometimes it was very courageous, but it was always respectful. And um, uh, it truly helped us to think harder and um, I think pushed all of us. And so we really appreciate that. And I think uh, it's already been noted that your appointees were also much appreciated. Um, I think this is the first time that I've seen where, I've, where we've had a representative who really took advantage of, again, expanding that student voice so that we had even more input from the rest of the students. And we really enjoyed it when we had, when you, we had the opportunity for you to recognize your student appointees. That was wonderful. Um, we are here to educate all of these students, these children, and we depend on your thoughtfulness and on your reflection of what you are seeing in the community. And those of us who were at your graduation Saturday night, it was wonderful uh, to see you walk across the stage. And we wish you much luck in your adventures going forward, and do keep in touch. And I believe now it is time for us to have a picture and exchange some gifts for you. Oh, Dr. Braybrand, would you like to say something? Yes. You know? Yes, and we also let. I'll say this. I know you've been on this as the school board rep and the board has shared and you've done all these amazing things, but I, this is what I want folks at home and in this audience. You left a personal note for every single one of us this evening, handwritten in your words saying thank you to us. You are a class act and a woman of character, and thank you for serving this school system. Here, here. And Nihirika, would you like to say a few words, your last grand opportunity here before we give you your gifts? So I have some few remarks for the issues on today's agenda, but I'll save that for Student Representative Matters. So as all of you know, today is my first meeting as a newly minted FCPS graduate and also my last meeting at this dais as student representative. So I just wanted to extend my sincerest gratitude to everyone who has helped me get to this point. 
So first to my parents, who have been a source of endless support for me throughout my life, and especially in this past year. So especially in this past year, as I took on the time commitment of this role, it's not really easy to wait until one or two in the morning when I'm driving back from meetings, or to rearrange their schedules so that I can have the car so I can make it to our meetings and all of these countless other events. My parents have done all of this and more to help me have the opportunities that I do. And to my younger sister, who's currently holding the video camera, she's been a source of humor to me over these past few years during stressful times, and is constantly curious about the work we do as a board. I really admire her for having that lighthearted spirit. And to everyone sitting at this dais, and school board office members, leadership team, serving as student representative has been the learning experience of a lifetime, and all of you have been so patient in answering my questions and help, be, being so supportive in helping me get my ideas off the ground, and incorporating the student input that I bring to this dais in the various decisions we've made throughout the year. And to everyone in this auditorium and everyone in the Fairfax family, I want to thank all of you for welcoming to me the, to this role and reaching out to me with questions, concerns, and ideas for how we can improve the learning experience for all of our students in FCPS. As some of you know, I didn't start in Fairfax. I moved here right before seventh grade from the opposite side of the country. And while I was terrified to start my first day of school, the Fairfax family really welcomed me to the system and encouraged me to pursue my interests in whatever they may be, computer science, government, policy making, and I really felt embraced here. And it's an FCPS where I found some of my closest friends and I've had some of the most wonderful academic and extracurricular opportunities that I could have asked for. The culture of learning, inquiry, and service that FCPS has instilled in me will continue to shape my future and my life. In the, and in the fall, because of this, I've chosen to attend the Robertson Scholars Leadership Program, and this experience as student representative and every single experience I've had since I walked in the door in seventh grade here in Fairfax have encouraged me to pursue service and leadership throughout my career and, more importantly, throughout my life. Thank you again to all of you for allowing me the opportunity to serve as student representative. It's been the honor of a lifetime. And now may I ask for all board members and um, Nihirika's family and supporters to come to the dais.
I will call on Ms. Evans for the recognition of our school resource officers who are standing handsomely at the back of the room this evening. <laughs> Ms. Evans. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is my, my honor and privilege to offer this recognition um, of the 2018 school resource officers. I'll just say briefly that we've known for a long time how important our SROs are in our schools. Uh, we have SROs in every high school and in every middle school, and they are an intrinsic part of the uh, education of our students in those schools. We know that they connect with the students, that they get to know them, the students um, uh, get to know the SROs as well, and we appreciate that so much. Of course, we've had it come into very high focus recently just how incredibly important our SROs are to the safety and security of our students. And now I'll read the recognition. Fairfax County Public Schools and the police departments of Fairfax County, Fairfax City, and the town of Herndon have enjoyed a mutually beneficial relationship for more than two decades. One of the hallmarks of this relationship is the School Resource Officer Program. SROs partner with school administrators to ensure safe, productive, and inviting school environments for students and staff by deterring crime, maintaining orderly schools, and preventing truancy. In addition, SROs provide relevant safety education programs to FCPS students. Many SROs also volunteer as student mentors through the Mentors Work Program serving as trusted adults that students can depend on to assist them in making healthy and safe choices. Furthermore, SROs play a critical role in ensuring the success of the Alternative Accountability Program, a collaborative and community-oriented response to juvenile offenses that utilizes the principles of restorative justice to hold students accountable for their actions while at the same time preventing formal court involvement and satisfying the needs of victims. Simply put, in order for students to be successful, they require safe and productive learning environments. Our SROs help provide these positive environments and also establish valued and trusted relationships with students and staff. Please welcome City of Fairfax Chief of Police, Carl R. R. Pardini, and all of our law enforcement officers who are with us this evening. Please come to the dais for a photo with the school board. And thank you so much for everything you do.
One more just like that. And we're going to go high, looking right up here. Perfect. Thank you so much. I will call on Ms. Corbett Sanders for recognition of the TSA Technosphere Competition winners. Thank you, Chairman Strauss. On behalf of the Fairfax County School Board, it is an honor for me to recognize the students from the Fairfax County Public Schools who won first place awards in the 2018 Technology Student Association, the TSA, Technosphere <laughs> Competition. The Technology Student Association is open to students who have currently enrolled in technology education courses or have completed courses in the past. TSA's membership includes over 150,000 middle and high school students in 2,000 schools across 48 states. TSA is supported by educators, parents, and business leaders who believe in the need for a, techno a technologically literate society members learn through exciting competitive events, leadership opportunities, and workshops. Every spring, the Virginia Association of the Technology Student Association hosts its annual leadership conference, Technosphere. The Technosphere Conference is the highlight of the Virginia TSA year and provides an incredible opportunity for members to compete, lead, and learn through competitive events for middle and high school students, leadership workshops, and other special events. During Technosphere, members gain experience and insight through networking with other students, teachers, parents, and members of the business community. These interactions throughout Technosphere strengthen the goals of innovation and collaboration through science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM education. Members exercise their technical knowledge, leadership skills, and professionalism as they get engage in competitive events, projects, and seminars. This year, Fairfax County Public School students earned 20 first place awards at the TSA Technosphere Competition. On behalf of the Fairfax County School Board, I would like to recognize the students and their teachers from Twain Middle School, Carson Middle School, Kilmer Middle School, West Potomac High School, Thomas Jefferson High School, Hayfield Secondary School, Chantilly High School, Oakton High School and West Springfield High School for their outstanding work. This achievement is a testament to your talent, dedication, and hard work. We wish you continued success and all the best in your future endeavors. At this time, I would like to invite all of our Technosphere champion teachers and students to please join the board at the dais for a photo.
Next, we will recognize the 2018 VEX Robotics Team. We would like to congratulate the outstanding accomplishments of the Rising Phoenix Team, which is comprised of students from four Fairfax County Public Schools, Cooper and Longfellow Middle Schools and Churchill Road and Spring Hill Elementary School. In April, the Rising Phoenix Team showcased their robot at the U.S. News Workforce for Tomorrow and the USA Science and Engineering Festival in Washington, D.C. This team was then invited to attend the 2018 VEX IQ Challenge at the VEX Robotics World Championship in Louisville, Kentucky, where they won the two highest awards, the Excellence and Teamwork Champion Awards. Rising Phoenix also won the CREATE Award for their exceptional innovative robot design and were also inducted into the STEM Hall of Fame. We would also like to congratulate parent and coach, Mr. Yun Lee, who motivated and guided this team to their third consecutive win along with all their mentors. The team worked hard to build and test their robot and conduct STEM research on ethics and robotics. As community service, the team conducts workshops to encourage robotics and younger kids in some of our local libraries. We congratulate, we congratulate Mr. Lee and the Rising Phoenix team for a job well done and we wish you all the best in your future endeavors in STEM. Please welcome the Rising Phoenix team, Mr. Lee, and all the mentors to the dais for a picture with the board. The next order of business is citizen participation. Tonight, 10 citizens have signed up to address the board, and we also have five video testimonies. Speakers are requested to limit their remarks to not more than three minutes. The school board will not hear statements involving issues that have been scheduled for public hearings, such as capital improvement program, budget, and boundaries. Complaints regarding individual students, or school-based employees should be directed to the appropriate school principal or other school official. Speakers should refrain from using personally identifiable information in connection with an individual student. Speakers are expected to deliver their comments with the decorum and respect appropriate to the conduct of the public's business. Please be mindful that there are often young children in attendance at these meetings or watching at home. So language should be appropriate for all age levels. Thank you for your cooperation, and thanks to those who have come to speak to us tonight. Our first speaker is Allison Munchie. Tonight, I yield my time to Reverend David Miller. Good evening. When I was here last, I listened carefully to the arguments on either side of the family life education curriculum. 
I was surprised how often folks on one side of this argument cited what God thought or wanted when it came to the language and concepts under discussion. I wish through the years that I was amazed at how many times I've heard an interpretation of what God wants when people were talking about politics and social issues, but I'm not. We are living in difficult times. There's so much polarity in our politics, polarization in our religion, and as much as some would like it to be so, there's no ownership on what God wants. I do not presume to know what God wants, but I have always believed that if God is involved in our lives, then why do we think that God supports one specific side? We are facing some big questions right now in this world. Are we going to be more open and loving? Are we going to be more accepting of people for the beauty in their hearts and in their souls? Are we going to use language and concepts that reflects a change, changing perspectives and new understandings of the human condition? Or are we going to continue this movement, current movement in society backwards, relying on philosophies and theologies based on fear and intolerance, a closed version of God's love, a presumption of who is in and who is out? I myself think if God's love is apparent in the world, it wouldn't be given in the most narrowly defined way possible. It would be expansive, especially for those who are seen by the mainstream as different, especially by those who have historically been on the margins of society. I am grateful for each and every one of you on this board who's made various sacrifices to serve our community. And I'd like to thank you especially for the time when you, what you do helps to serve everyone Everyone, including especially those most vulnerable, especially those who often suffer at the hands of systems that can demand adherence and obedience, and not the celebration of uniqueness and the beauty of each individual. It feels right now like we're in a struggle for the soul of this country. I'd like to encourage the board to come down on the side of inclusion, of celebration, of expansive understanding of embracing love, and an involving, forward-thinking, and an inclusive version of public policy. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Laura Bryant Hanford. Good evening, I'm a mom of five and I thank all of you wearing purple or green because we came here tonight because we love our kids. And it is true that Jesus said that, that the truth will set us free, but these recommendations imprison students in half-truths and lies. Let's start with the science. Biological sex is not a mistake, it's not a stigma, it's not a choice. Fleekat conflates an extremely rare disorder which does require assignment with gender dysphoria. Like saying some kids are colorblind, so we're gonna teach kids that color does not exist. Fleekat voted to use a term based on a view that biological sex is meaningless. Well, I'm a determined researcher. For months I've been reading the medical literature and talking to clinicians inside and outside FCPS. So I asked for input from a renowned PhD molecular geneticist, and he said, there's a rich medical legal, and legal history behind the use of objective measures, including biological sex. <clears throat> if one was to use the standard sex assigned at birth, one would rightfully be driven out of medicine. You said this term is endorsed by every med major medical organization. Really, Google it. See if you can find one that has a policy endorsing the use of sex assigned at birth instead of biological sex, just one. Let's dig a little deeper. Let's say the American Association of Pediatrics has 64,000 members, they've been quoted. Well, their position paper on transgender care, which does not endorse this as a policy, requires approval not by 64,000 members, but by about six. So what is true is that thousands of medical professionals in Virginia alone have directly endorsed the position that sex is not assigned at birth. <clears throat> FLECAC has actively suppressed critical medical information, voted 12 times against giving kids critical information about gender transition and the enormous risks, including persisting suicide and many other things, including risks of birth control. FLECAC has chosen to support ideology over biology. And 
It's broken. Community input is overwhelmingly against these recommendations, five times more against than four. January was the first formal opportunity to review the new lessons, but as soon as I questioned the doctrine, I was out. Replaced by an ideologue who would spearhead the effort to completely suppress all debate and discussion of this issue, though it was the first time these lessons had been reviewed. That's a textbook play of authoritarian regimes, which was my background. Ironically, 20 years ago, Gamal Mubarak gave me three hours to engage him on an oppressive law. This committee voted against giving me three minutes to discuss my own motion. So I'm asking you tonight, teach science, not ideology, and put the same level of effort into engaging your community as you have into suppressing it. Thank you. The next speaker is Reverend Dr. Deborah W. Hafner. The next speaker is Reverend Dr. Deborah W. Hafner. Good evening. I'm the minister at the Unitarian Universalist Church in Reston, and I have been a sexuality educator for more than 40 years. Prior to coming to serving my church in Northern Virginia, I was the president of the Religious Institute for 15 years and the president of the Sexuality Information and Education Council of the United States for 12 years. I am also the author of three books for parents on talking to children and teenagers, as well as being a mother myself. I want to applaud the proposal of the committee to update the existing curriculum to be more inclusive of transgender students by using the language sex assigned at birth and to including information about PrEP as part of STI prevention. Surely, all of us can agree that school-based programs should be age appropriate, medically accurate, and up to date. Education that is based on such information respects and empowers young people and has more integrity than education based on incomplete information, out-of-date terminology, and fear-based tactics. The proposed language changes are more inclusive of our LGBTQ students than the current curriculum. As a faith leader who believes that sexual and gender diversity is a blessing, and who just chaired Reston's first Pride Festival, attended by over 1,200 people, I applaud these recommendations. Sexuality education must benefit all young people, all of our young people, regardless of their sexual orientation, their gender identity, or their gender expression. We must assure that all of our young people receive the information and education they need, not just now, but for their future, so they can make responsible sexual decisions. As a religious leader, I have a scriptural and theological commitment to truth-telling, including truth-telling about sexuality. I am joined by millions of people of faith and thousands of clergy from diverse denominations in our belief that young people need comprehensive, accurate, and up-to-date sexuality education. There is no research to support ignorance and incomplete education. There are decades of studies that show that young people who receive education that includes information about abstinence, contraception, and STI prevention are more likely to delay having sex and more likely to use methods when they do become sexually involved. Others will talk to you tonight about the public health arguments that support the proposed changes. I'm going to ask you to also consider the universal values that underlie these changes, that our curricula should honor truth-telling, that they should be inclusive of all of the children in our school, and they should provide the most current information. Surely, we can all agree that we want our people, our young people, to learn about sexuality from trusted educators, not the internet, not entertainment media. May you, this school board, be truth-seeking, courageous, and just in your efforts to provide all young people with the sexuality education they so urgently need. Thank you. The next speaker is David Aponte. David Aponte. Good evening to the members of the Fairfax County School Board, Dr. Braybrand, school staff, and the Fairfax County community. My name is David Aponte, and I am the co-chair of Glisten Nova, an organization dedicated to creating safe and affirming schools for all, regardless of sexual orientation, 
gender identity, or gender expression. I'm here to speak in support of the sensible, reasonable recommendations from the Family Life Education Curriculum Advisory Committee regarding lessons in grades eight through 12. A little over a month ago, I spoke to you on this very topic and discussed the real impact that language changes such as this one, such as the ones proposed, have on, have on specifically trans and intersex youth. Sex assigned at birth is not a made up phrase by any political organization. It is not a part of some agenda and it is certainly not designed to distort science or lead young people away from it. I'd like to directly quote an issue paper on human rights and intersex people from the Commissioner for Human Rights within the Council of Europe in saying, a strong fear of stigmatization and social exclusion forces most intersex people to stay in the closet even when they become aware of their sex. Moreover, society remains largely ignorant about the existence of intersex people since hardly any information is made available to the public about the matter. Consequently, for many years, the human rights problems affecting intersex people's well-being were either unknown or ignored. Ignorance and allowing people to be who they actually are is what this is all about. Strong education fights ignorance. Changing language like this will not lead to confusion for young people, just like protecting students on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity and expression did not lead to a loss of privacy for students. Just like mentioning LGBTQ plus issues in family life education did not lead to an epidemic of students changing their identities. The accusations that have been lobbed at the FLECAC, the school board, and organizations like GLSEN are baseless, detrimental, and simply false. The same people making the most noise against this change are the same people that we had to protect our own student representatives from at previous school board meetings. These are the same people who gave us the proof we needed that LGBTQ plus students deserved and needed specific mentions in the school's non-discrimination policy. The recommendations made by the Flea CAC are in line with society's progression on language when it comes to these issues. What they have proposed is not radical in any way. It is, however, meaningful. What it means for an intersex student is an affirmation that being who they are is not wrong. What it means for a trans student is an affirmation that the school they attend is learning to and it's keeping up with science. What it means for any student, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity and expression, is that their school can be a safe place for education, not just for the students, but for the whole community. One of the three key words for Fairfax County Public Schools is thrive. Isn't that what we are trying to do? I believe that you all truly are. I thank you for your leadership on this issue, and I hope that you'll support these recommendations. The next speaker is Shyam Munshi. Shyam Munchi. Good evening. Um, you've each heard from us separately previously, so tonight we'd like to talk to you as, uh, together as parents, FCPS parents. Our daughter is not transgender because she's allowed to be or because her parents are liberal hippies. <laughs> it's not because she just wants to be a girl. She's not transgender because she's allowed, uh, because it's a fad or a trend or an attention getter. Not, uh, not because she read a book about being trans. And most importantly, for tonight at least, she's not transgender because she learned about it in the FLE program. <laughs> I've thought so much about what it must be like to be transgender. Because I'm not, of course, I'll never really know. But because I'm an advocate for our daughter and kids like her, and I'm countering the hateful nonsense I hear about it being a mental illness, I'm constantly trying to figure out a way to make it make sense to others. So my comparatively minor analogy is the jolt I experience when I look in the mirror sometimes to see a bald guy. Uh, but that's easy, right? I could put on a hat. What I can't imagine fully is that jolt if I'm told I cannot or should not try to align my internal and external appearances. Here's another analogy. We're only aware of oxygen when there is none. We don't feel a discomfort, a struggle to breathe, except in its absence. I assume that's how it feels to be transgender, to feel a sense of discord between how the world sees you and how you see yourself. The proposed changes in the language of FLE instruction defines what it means to be transgender. It does not offer medical advice, encourage students to change genders, or suggest that being transgender comes with no consequences or no need for professional support. Our daughter is transgender because it's who she is. And because of that, we have supported her the way any responsible parent would. 
We have taken her to experienced and trained professionals who have cared for her medical and emotional well-being. It is not as if she came to us at six years old and said, I'm a girl, and we and the medical profession supported irreversible measures. It's not like that. So I ask you to be aware of those well-funded vocal minority groups generated outside Fairfax County that are trying to derail the narrative. Resist the urge to listen to discredited organizations like the American College of Pediatrics, which has 500 members, and instead heed the advice of the 65,000 member American Academy of Pediat Pediatrics and countless other reputable professional organizations. This is about our diverse FCPS community. It's about respect for our students. It's about best practice and using the most current research that overwhelmingly supports the term sex assigned at birth to steer how we educate the kids in our classrooms. So we will keep telling our story with our daughter's permission, of course. We know that it matters and we know that it will ultimately make the difference. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Katherine Belkoff. Good evening. My name is Kat Belkoff, and I'm a graduate of Poplar Tree Elementary School, Rocky Run Middle School, and South Lakes High School. I will first ask those of you who are standing to please sit. I feel that standing for speakers can be divisive. There is a lot of tension in this room tonight, but there is also a lot of love that love comes from all the parents in this room on both sides of the issue, reaching out to support their children and the children of this county. Every single parent here loves their child. Please allow me to share a story about my family's love. In 2011, my sister was studying in France. My mom was working full time and my dad was running for this school board. I spent two weeks in the hospital recovering from a suicide attempt. They couldn't pump my stomach because it had been too long and they were in constant contact with poison control because my liver was shutting down. Unfortunately, I was allergic to the antidote they gave me and I broke out in hives all over my body. They gave me stimulants to control the hives. My mom asked the doctor what they would do if the stimulants didn't work and they had to take me off the stimulants and the antidote. And the doctor said, then we pray. My mother slept in a chair in the hospital for two weeks because she loves me. I think every parent in this room on both sides would do the same thing. I am here tonight because no other family should go through what mine did and no children should go through what I did. Thankfully, I am now under the care of an excellent psychiatrist, but not everyone gets the help they need in time. According to the National Institute for Health, approximately 32 to 50% of trans people attempt suicide, and that rate is closer to 50% among trans youth. Lack of social and family support for trans youth increases suicidal ideation and suicide attempts. Trans youth with family support are 82% less likely to attempt suicide. Trans youth whose parents reject their gender are 13 times more likely to attempt suicide. Let me be clear, using language that is inclusive of queer, trans, non-binary, genderqueer, and gender non-conforming people is suicide prevention. Tonight, I ask you to vote to use the language sex assigned at birth, and I will end on a reminder from history. It was white people who decided that blacks could be free. It was men who decided that women could vote. It was straight people who decided that gays could marry, and it will be cis people who decide the fate of trans people in America. The next speaker is Risa May. We moved from another state into Fairfax County in the summer of 2013. My youngest daughter was a rising fourth grader. I was a bit nervous about that first week of school 
because not only was she going to be the new girl, she was going to be the new girl wearing boys' clothes. Uh, I didn't have to worry, it was fine, nobody cared. <laughs> In sixth grade, one of her good friends told his friends he was gay. And that wasn't a big deal either, and he's now out in middle school and still, no big deal. One of her good friends these days is trans. Nobody makes a big deal about that. They are, however, very excited about the fact that she loves baking and shares her experiments with her Spanish class. I am so grateful for the wonderful children of this county who accept each other for who they are. They know that their differences are far less important than the fact that they are funny, smart, and kind. I'm very grateful to all of the teachers and administrators who serve as role models for this perspective, leading by example. The language of our FLE curriculum needs to demonstrate the same care and support for all children. In this curriculum, children consider their life experiences, how they identify themselves, and how they relate to the people in their lives. It is crucial that we explicitly support them by giving them the language to do that freely, while affirming their value as individuals and as members of our families and our community. Please, let's use lessons and language that make our children, all of our children, feel valued for who they are. For this reason, I support replacing the words biological gender with sex assigned at birth. I also support including information about PrEP in our FLE curriculum, because an important part of, share, of showing children that they matter is providing them with information that keeps them safe as they continue to explore who they are and find their place in the world. We all know that's not easy. Let's not make it any harder. Thank you. The next speaker is Gordon Baer. Ooh. Before I start, I'd just like to um, clarify something that was said by Laura Hanford. It took me literally seconds to find medical associations that use sex assigned at birth on this phone with such poor data. So let's cast that aside. Um, I'm Gordon Bear. I am the full product of an FCPS education. Uh, Groveton Elementary, go Tigers. Sandburg Middle, go Panthers. And West Potomac High School, go Wolverines. And I am here to ask you to pass the FLE updates and to not try and stick in that perennial op-out rider because that's just doing no one a good service. Um, I became an LGBT advocate when I came out at 14, um, and it became very clear to me that um, I wasn't being attended to, and a lot of my LGBT peers weren't being attended to in the same way that our heterosexual counterparts were. It wasn't their fault, it was the system at hand. Um, so I was a GSA president, a student leader, tried to push things along, um, and here I am today, a community member, um, and someone who hopes that with this passage, a lot of the anti-LGBT violence that I experienced in the school system and many of my peers did will dissipate with visibility. Um, seeing yourself in, uh, well, not seeing yourself in family life education is, it's like you're invited to a party and you don't know anyone there and you don't know the theme and you come out of it very confused because it doesn't really relate to you. Um, so having something in there that will um, be able to be useful for LGBT youth as they live their authentic lives moving forward from FCPS um, will be a huge boon. Um, I will say, as uh, an LGBT advocate, I had to learn that sometimes parents don't love their children. Um, and I'm saying love as in that William Barber, Bishop Michael Curry, unconditional, divinely inspired, good love and not a conditional affection, which is different. Um, and I just want to say it's the children of the people who hate LGBT people the most that are the most vulnerable to a lot of the things that um, the updates will address. 
So uh, with the rest of my time, I'd like to have a moment of silence for the uh, victims of anti-LGBT violence and the individuals responsible for making sure that system stays in place. Thank you. The next speaker is William Kellidge. Hi, my name is William Elledge, and I am an active voter. My daughter has attended Greenbrier, Rocky Run, and Chantilly. I have generally been impressed with FCPS. I'm very pleased to hear the proposed changes to the FLE curriculum. The proposed changes are positive. In my three minutes, I'm going to speak about two points regarding the transgender inclusive language changes. The first is eliminating isolation and social stigma, and the second is about my religious beliefs. First, Regarding isolation and social stigma, 41% of transgender people have attempted suicide, 41%, while 4.6% of non-transgender people have attempted suicide. Why the difference? Transgen transgender youth face discrimination and feel isolation. The proposed wording changes promote inclusion of transgender youth. The changes will help them feel accepted. The changes will encourage them to seek help should they need it. Even if you don't accept transgender identities, open up the wording in the FLE so these children feel more comfortable going to someone instead of taking their own lives. Second, much of the discussion about transgender issues is centered on religion, so you can't ignore it. I was raised in a religion that teaches that transgender, being transgender is a sin, but I've grown and learned that being transgender is natural and healthy. Depending on how biblical text is translated, Ruth, David, and the centurion may have been gay. Paul may or may not have preached about homosexual, against homosexuality, but he also taught women should not speak and nor have authority over men. Jesus never spoke out against homosexuality and, again, depending on translation, may have said some men are born gay and transgender. If it was a sin, he surely would have said something. Instead of shunning those different than himself, Jesus asked a Samaritan woman for water at Jacob's well. For those of you who are so inclined, I'm asking you to follow Jesus' example of loving everyone, no matter how different they are. You don't get to determine what is a sin. You certainly don't get to be the judge. Yes. Now, I live in the Sully District. Mr. Wilson, I encourage you to change your viewpoints on this, on this matter. Um, and, and I, I might also point out, when you responded to my email, you didn't actually tell me what your viewpoint was. I introduced myself by saying I'm an active voter. I actually like knocking on doors, informing voters about what our elected officials have done, and you have an opportunity to get this canvasser carrying a clipboard with your name on it. My email's in your notes. For those of you who vote for the proposed changes, please reach out to me when you're up for re-election. I will knock on doors for you. I'd like to thank you for your time and effort, especially on behalf of the S FCPS students. Lastly, I hope to thank you for your vote on inclusive language. The next speaker is Hope Wojciak. Jesus loves sinners, not sin. And you should know. He likes silence. <laughs> Good evening. As a Fairfax County resident and FCPS parent, I'm here to voice my opposition to the FLE committee recommendations and urge you to adopt the recommendations laid out in the dissenting opinion instead. I oppose the recommended change from biological sex to sex assigned at birth because biological sex is the medically and biologically accurate term to use when referring to a person's sex, which includes chromosomes, hormones, and internal and external reproductive organs. A person's sex is not something that is assigned at birth or otherwise. It is established at conception when an egg is fertilized and a new set of DNA is formed with chromosomes XX for a female or XY for a male. This is what students are taught in biology classes and should remain consistent throughout the curriculum. This board should not support and promote students being taught something that is untrue 
and inconsistent with human biology. The FLE committee justified this change from biological sex to sex assigned at birth by claiming that the medical community now uses this phrase. As someone who very recently gave birth, I can say that this is absolutely untrue. My fifth son is only five weeks old. When I was 13 weeks pregnant with him, I elected to have a blood test that would detect chromosomal abnormalities. From that blood test, the doctors were able to locate my child's DNA, and from that they were able to determine that the child I was carrying had XY chromosomes and therefore was a boy. The results sent to me stated exactly this, quote, it's a boy. Results consistent with two sex chromosomes XY. My son's sex was further confirmed at a 20-week ultrasound. At no point during my pregnancy did the doctors, nurses, sonographer, or anyone else within the medical community use that phrase or insinuate that my, sex, my son's sex would be assigned once he was born. They all referred to him as a boy, even before his birth. Proponents of this change think that biological sex is meaningless a statement made by the committee member who proposed the change. I happen to think that biological sex is very meaningful. Knowing a person's biological sex allows a doctor to accurately diagnose that individual. A person who presents to their doctor with abdominal pain will have a very different diagnosis depending on whether he or she is a biological male or female. Our biological sex is also important for reproduction. Only a biological male and biological female can create another human being. I assume that the FLE lessons already discuss the differences between a person's gender identity and biological sex. As such, there is no need to remove and render a scientific term like biological sex meaningless in the eyes of students. It is not meaningless. Again, I ask that you adopt the recommendations in the dissenting opinion and make FLE opt in, requiring written parental consent to participate. Currently, students need written parental consent to take medication in school, go on a field trip, or watch a PG-rated movie. Fairfax County's FLE program goes well beyond the facts of puberty and human reproduction, and it's time for Fairfax to genuinely partner with parents on this topic and require written parental consent for these very controversial lessons. Silence does not equal consent. Thank you. We now have five video testimonies. The first video testimony is presented by Meg Kilgannon. I'm submitting this letter on behalf of the American College of Pediatricians, the American Association of Pro-Life OBGYNs, and the Christian Medical and Dental Society. We treat thousands of young women and our young people in our offices face to face. We see up close the negative consequences of premature sexual activity that are borne out by national statistics. Sexuality education that demonstrates long-term efficacy in assisting parents to promote optimal adolescent health should be welcomed by all. Effective sex education curricula emphasize how to achieve the highest attainable standard of health through risk avoidance. Abstinence from all sexual activity is the only 100% effective way for teens to avoid pregnancy, sexually transmitted infections, and associated emotional disorders. Sexually abstinent teens make significantly healthy, healthier life choices than their sexually active peers. Sexual risk avoidance curricula emphasize the benefits of sexual abstinence and have been shown to increase sexual abstinence without diminishing contraceptive use among youth who are already sexually active. Recommending PrEP as a safe and effective way for adolescents to be sexually active and avoid HIV infection is negligent at best. Despite PrEP's recent FDA approval for adolescents in high-risk groups, such as teenage boys who have sex with men, rigorous, large, long-term studies of PrEP in adolescents have not been done. There's only one American study that examined PrEP, PrEP use among adolescent boys who have sex with men. The study followed 78 teen boys for just under one year. The boys were paid $50 to $75 per doctor visit to participate in risk behavior counseling, receive the necessary blood work to monitor side effects, and document drug intake. Among these paid participants, only 22% of boys complied with the proper dosing based on their blood work. This is a reflection of the cognitive immaturity of all adolescents and their inherent tendency to underestimate risk. In fact, it's very likely that widespread use of PrEP in this age group would trigger risk compensation in which individuals gain an inflated sense of security and subsequently engage in riskier sexual activity than they would otherwise would. 
Sex is an innate biological trait established by the DNA contained in sex chromosomes at fertilization. Sex declares itself in utero. It is recognized and acknowledged at birth. Sex is not assigned. Gender refers to the stereotypical social roles associated with sex. Gender is not an innate biological trait. Gender identity refers to a person's awareness of being male or female. Gender identity is a cognitive and psychological trait that exists in the mind. In sum, as physicians dedicated to promoting optimum adolescent health, we urge the Fairfax County School Board to reject the proposed revisions to its family life education curriculum. The next testimony is presented by Monique Baruti. As an engineer, I object to the term sex assigned at birth. It is simply not scientifically factual. There is a major problem with the disconnect between teaching children facts about biology and then lying to them to say that sex is assigned at birth. Since the introduction of ultrasound technology and its increased use throughout American hospitals starting in the 1970s, parents have had the opportunity to learn the sex of their child in utero. Science is a pretty amazing thing. As an athlete, I object to the term sex assigned at birth. I have participated in amateur athletics since the age of about seven, starting with synchronized swimming, eventually racing swimming, running, and a couple of triathlons too. In most sports, there are different categories for males and females because we are biologically different. The different categories serve to make a level playing field. In the 2018 Boston Marathon, for example, 141 males finished before the fastest female. If females are required to compete against biological males, then the equality females have been fighting for for decades will be eroded. Transgender students have a right to compete in sports, but what they are being given is an unfair advantage. Girls shouldn't have to lose out on opportunities to males. Girls deserve better than that. As a mother who has suffered pregnancy loss, I object to the term sex assigned at birth. Over the last 10 years, I have helped many women who have suffered pregnancy loss find healing. If a family suffers the death of their child before it is born, and it never had the opportunity for someone to assign its sex upon birth, is the baby any less their son or daughter? Using the term sex assigned at birth takes away from the humanity of the unborn child. Having delivered three preterm babies myself, I can assure you of the humanity of the unborn. As a woman, I object to the term sex assigned at birth. I reject the idea that biology is meaningless and that a man can simply change his genitals, take some hormones, and declare that he is the exact same thing as me. He is not. He will never be able to conceive and bear children as I have. I am a woman. I have made many sacrifices to carry and bear my children as a result of the gift of my womanhood, and I won't let anyone cheapen that. I am more than the makeup I wear or the clothes that I put on. We can help children who identify with a different gender embrace their authentic selves without requiring the distortion of the meaning of sex for every child. Our children deserve biology, not ideology. The next video is presented by David Hatcher. Good evening. I would like to provide feedback on the FLECAC annual report. The FLECAC is now recommending teaching the scientifically inaccurate FLA material, sex assigned at birth. The new definition is misleading as children born with ambiguous anatomy are astronomically rare and do not represent normal human variation of the two human sexes. It is also scientifically inaccurate as sex is assigned by chromosomes soon after conception occurs and is physically permanent. Lastly, it is deceptively used to portray that people with the rare psychiatric disorder gender dysphoria can choose their sex if they feel like it. Gender dysphoria is more common among children than adults. Up to 90% of children with gender dysphoria have been found to desist. Such by adulthood, 99.99% of the population is aligned with their natural biological sex. 
because so many children desist naturally demonstrates they do not have opposite sex brains nor are born in the wrong body. Adults with gender dysphoria have been found to have a super high suicidal rate of 40%. The treatment options for children with gender dysphoria are wait till adulthood to see if persistent, where up to 90% of the gender dysphoric children have been found to desist and align with their biological sex, or to implement the Dutch protocol and transition early. Children who transition early and given puberty blockers appear to have a higher rate of persistence. Those who undergo gender reassignment surgery still have an astronomical long-term suicidal rate 19 times higher than the general population. The wait and see method minimizes risks to children because up to 90% of gender dysphoric children are reported to desist naturally, which places them in the lowest suicide rate pool. Transitioning early may dramatically increase the number of suicides as it may interfere and reduce the number of children who would desist naturally and instead place them into the persistent pool with potentially higher suicide rates. While those who undergo gender reassignment surgery still have a super high long-term suicidal rate 19 times higher than the general population, the harmful impacts from attempts to transitioning early may take 30 years to completely study, which makes it an experiment. Experimenting on children is morally wrong and potentially illegal. The wait and see approach should be encouraged as a large majority will naturally desist and lead to the lowest suicide rate. And many experts question the moral and ethical use of the Dutch protocol, including giving chemicals to developing children. There is also a growing concern of the harmful social contagion to the general student body by normalizing and glamorizing dysphoria. The bottom line is schools should not engage in high risk and harmful experiments. In summary, it is recommended that the school board not adopt scientifically inaccurate and misleading sex assigned at birth in the FLE. Instead, they should support the wait and see approach for gender dysphoria as the best way to reduce depression and suicides. And lastly, they should remove gender identity from all school policies and regulations as it is a medical issue like many others. The next video is presented by Rodrigo Velasquez. Good evening, members of the school board. My name is Rodrigo Velasquez. I'm a resident of Springfield, Virginia, and a proud product of Fairfax County Public Schools, having attended elementary, middle, and high school here in the county. The reason for my message today is to provide input on two very important topics, both related to the Family Life Education Curriculum's Advisory Committee. The first is regarding pre-exposure prophylaxis, also known as PrEP. PrEP is a once daily pill that greatly reduces the risk of contracting HIV. It's important that all students are aware of PrEP because a couple years ago, HIV was not only greatly feared, but greatly misunderstood. Now, thanks to the hard work of many in the medical profession, we now have ways to not only treat HIV, but prevent the spread of it. Educating all students about PrEP is something that would greatly benefit our community's health. The second topic is regarding the use of the term sex assigned at birth. Not only is that term used by many in the medical profession, but it's more importantly is something that's preferred and wanted by many in the LGBTQ community. We may disagree on some things that I shared, but I know we can all agree that we wanna do what's best for all students. Well, all students includes all LGBTQ students. All students includes everyone who should be educated around the topic of PrEP in the Family Life Education Curriculum. I hope that every member of the school board supports the education of PrEP and the use of the term sex assigned at birth. I know that together we can work to create and foster more welcoming classrooms. By doing so, we're going to greatly benefit many students in our county. The same students who are our future business leaders, our future educators, our future community members, which include our neighbors, people that we walk and talk down the street with. So I hope and I greatly, greatly urge every member of the school board to support the education of PrEP in our classrooms and the use of the term sex assigned at birth in our curriculum. Thank you very much. The last video testimony is presented by Omar Abdel Rahim.
Yeah, my name is Omar Abdel Rahim. Um, I'm a Muslim American. I'm a disabled veteran in the U.S. Navy. And I've lived in Fairfax County for over 20 years. And I have three children that are currently in Fairfax County Public Schools. Actually, I, I think the number is larger than that, just, just because the, we have some substantial size communities in Fairfax County, and um, we have well over 10 to 15 organizations and communities. So I, I, might, argue, uh, I might argue the number would be larger than that. Very. Oh, definitely. Uh, no question. It's critical because for us, it's, it, it, it's all about there's a reason why we're here. You know, and so our mission is clear. The fact that we have so many Muslim Americans here, you know, it's uh, it kind of helps us. We help each other and stand by each other to try to, uh, you know, accomplish our mission. I tell you, we 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 asked a lot of we we did a lot of outreach within our community, and I would say the mass majority didn't know what it was. Um, cause it's, uh, it, just, it was, a, it was a piece of paper that was in a, some kind of packet. They came home, uh, with another book and they don't, didn't really understand it, uh, or even knew what it was. And so we, our com community is very, fairly diverse. So there's many different languages that are spoken in our community. Um, so it, it could have been that the fact that they didn't understand the, the, the language that w it was written in or... They just don't even know what family life education was. I know that many, many, many families that I've spoken to about family life and opting out, they weren't even aware that they had an option to opt out of anything in school. They just thought if they taught it, you were stuck with it. No, I, I, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, it should actually be an opt-in. Uh, in my opinion, um, because the school system, and as far as when I was growing up, it was about math, science, reading, uh, writing. Uh, I mean, that was that school. We all thought that school was strictly academic until we were abre made abreast of the situation where gender identity and FLE and all of these all of these processes in place. We had no idea. We literally had no idea. Thank you to everyone who has come out to share your, um, your beliefs and concerns with us this evening. Next is Student Representative Matters, and I will call on Ms. Fetakanda. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. So first, I'm going to speak on the Fleet CAC recommendations and on the SR and our proposed changes. So on the Fleet CAC recommendations, I just want to make it clear, I do support all the changes included, including the change of the term from biological sex to sex assigned at birth. And I think, <clears throat> I think I should get into the reasoning for that first. So I think all of us here can agree that Besides, you know, doing well in like reading, math, and all the subjects, we want all of our students to be healthy and happy as the most important goal of our school system. And the point of FLE is to achieve kind of both of these by educating our students about things that they wouldn't learn in their regular classes. And it's a content that's designed to keep our students healthy, that's designed to keep them safe, and that's designed to generally just educate them. So I've worked with students on this committee. We actually have four students on the Fleet CAC committee, and I think that we've all, agreed, we've all agreed with our student input and working with students from a variety of schools that we have to be inclusive and our education has to be up to date, so that means that we need to, put, we need to change the term to sex assigned at birth, and we also need to, as a, as a provider of comprehensive sex education, include all the methods of STI prevention, including PrEP, and I think I, I think I understand some of the intention behind suggesting maybe an opt-in system, but rather than switching to an opt-in system, I think that we might be able to achieve some middle ground by doing a better job educating parents about the FLE curriculum and doing some more outreach to our communities and making sure that all the materials are translated, and then informing, making sure all parents know of their right to opt out so that preserves the FLE curriculum, by make, by, but also make sure that parents know what's going on so that they don't 
they're not objecting to this and so that they know what their rights are to opt out. And I think I'd like to comment on something we heard earlier from one of our citizens. Our students are already incredibly inclusive of each other and recognize and appreciate the diversity of our vast student body. I think on this one, the board should follow the lead of our students and move forward with adopting the flea CAC recommendations. <laughs> and on the SRNR proposed changes, I think I definitely approve all the changes that have been proposed. I, I'm really glad that we're including chronic absenteeism in this new SRNR. I know that's been an issue that I've spoke about. It's a problem that we're not really we're not really able to identify the extent of that problem because we don't really collect all this data on chronic absenteeism and we're not aware of how many of our students are missing school, maybe not just one day or two days in the year, but are missing over 10 days and are actually being severely impacted by the loss of instructional time. And I'm glad we're following the state and reducing the length of our suspension times because as we all know, the literature shows that when we have these extremely punitive suspension lengths then we're, going to, we're contributing to the school to prison pipeline. And lastly, I'd like to exp express my support for the new, uh, for the amendment to the SRNR proposed by Mr. McElveen to make sure that the dress code is fair to all of our students and is actually, <laughs> and is actually re reflective of the intention of our dress code amendment, which is to foster a good learning environment in our schools, not to unfairly target some of our students over the others. Okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Fetaconda. Next is confirmation of action taken in closed meeting. This is the portion of the meeting where the board will confirm any action regarding issues that were discussed in the closed meeting. These issues may include action taken regarding student disciplinary matters. Board members have discussed each individual case and at this time we'll make several motions to confirm the recommended action. I will call on Ms. Palchuk for a motion. I move to deny the school reassignment appeal of a student who threatened to commit acts of violence at school, resulting in a significant disruption of the educational environment, and to confirm the disciplinary decision of the, di decision of the division superintendent. Second. Seconded by Ms. Hines. All those in favor? That motion is unanimous. Thank you very much. The next, the next motion I will call on Ms. Corbett Sanders. I move to deny the school reassignment appeal of a student who assaulted a student at school, resulting in injury, and to confirm the disciplinary decision of the division superintendent. Second. Seconded by Mr. Moon. All those in favor? That motion is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, for the next motion, I will call on Ms. Darren Kofax. I move to deny the school reassignment appeal of a student who accessed unauthorized areas of the school building, stole school property, and distributed stolen school property, and to confirm the disciplinary decision of the division superintendent. Second. Seconded by Ms. Evans. All those in favor? That motion is unanimous. Thank you. Next, I will call on Ms. Hines for a motion. I move to deny the school reassignment appeal of a student who assaulted another student at school, resulting in injury, as well as significant disruption of the educational environment, and to confirm the disciplinary decision of the division superintendent. Seconded by Ms. Polchak. All those in favor? That motion is unanimous. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next, I will call on Ms. Hines for a motion. I move to deny the school reassignment appeal of a student who improperly touched another student and to confirm the disciplinary decision of the division superintendent. Seconded by Ms. Corbett Sanders. All those in favor? That is Evans, Evans, Wilson, McLaughlin, Polchek, McElveen, Corbett Sanders, Strauss, Moon, Hines, Darren Kofex, um, Keys Gamara. Opposed? Abstention? Ms. Schultz. Thank you. That motion passes. For the last motion, I will call on Ms. Hines. 
I move that the contracts with the teachers identified in closed session not be renewed at the conclusion of the 2017-2018 school year and the teachers notified that their contracts will not be renewed for the 2018-2019 school year. Seconded by Ms. Polchak. All those in favor? Okay, it is Evans, McLaughlin, Polchak, McElveen, Sanders, Strauss, Moon, Hines, Schultz, Dernak, Kofax, Keys, Gamara. Opposed or abstention? Mr. Wilson, that motion passes. Thank you. Next is Family Life Education Curriculum Advisory Committee Report of Recommendations. I will call on Ms. Hines for the first motion. Thank you. I move that the school board approve recommended media and lesson objectives as detailed in the agenda item and as reviewed and recommended by the Family Life Education Curriculum Advisory Committee. That is second by Ms. Polchuk. Ms. Hines, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, thank you. I want to thank our Family Life Education Curriculum Advisory Committee, FLECAC, and staff uh, once again this year for all of your hard work. Uh, for moving our curriculum forward. It's work that you do every year, and it's not easy, and we appreciate all the effort and time that goes into it. I want to also thank all the members of this community who have weighed in with us. I have read your emails and online comments. I've heard your testimony here. I think one thing that I just want to make sure everyone understands um, is that uh, parents who want their children to learn more or less or differently do have complete control over that. They can opt out. And I would like to ask, I'm gonna put staff on the spot for just a second, if you all don't mind. I, I, I didn't tell you this was coming, but I know I, I, maybe we should help the community understand how that information is made available. We do translate um, the messages about FLE curriculum into uh, other languages, is that correct? Uh, we do. Just. Uh a few other things that might be of uh, interest on this topic as well. So we do translate the opt-out forms into the seven most frequently used uh, languages in Fairfax County. Um, we also um, make sure that all of our lesson materials, curriculum materials, are available for parents online, uh, so parents can access those. Uh, the lesson materials are available at the public libraries uh, for folks that might not have internet access or members of the community to review. And we send out notifications and school newsletters and through central messaging from the communications department at the beginning of the year to make parents aware um, of the opt-out procedures. And all of our schools hold back to school information night sessions where parents can come and view the materials and ask questions about the materials as well. Okay, thank you. Um, and just to continue, I, for those who don't know, the school board has had some time to review FLECAC recommendations. We had a work session uh, last month at which we received um, the very extensive and excellent report from FLECAC. We asked questions. Those questions have been answered. All of that information is public. So um, I'm supporting these changes because they're based on sound research and they make our FLE curriculum more accurate and reflective of widely accepted, most up-to-date best practices. It is the role of FLECAC to navigate this conversation and to navigate our curriculum to that goal. And I appreciate very much uh, the work that they do, and I hope uh, my colleagues on the school board will also support their recommendations. Ms. Palchuk, would you like to speak to your second? Uh, yes. Uh, I will second Ms. Um, Ms. Hines' comments. I also want to thank staff, especially Liz Payne. I know I have heard from many FLECAC members that your utmost professionalism and care and thought um, makes this an extremely successful process, and we appreciate all the work and, and patience that you put into this, uh, along with your team. I do also want to thank all of the community, of the speakers that came here today, that have been here in the past, all who have written to us, and all who have shared their testimony. Um, this is, as, as a speaker said today, our children are, we're here because we all love our children, and I think we would all be hard-pressed to find a topic more important to us than their well-being. We don't always agree on what that is, um, but that is why we are here as a democracy and able to have conversations and discussions. I will agree with Ms. Hines that th these recommendations are based on best practices in science. Uh, as a teacher, I have seen this in uh, my students. I have learned from them, 
and schools that supported them and their transitions from feeling excluded, from feeling frightened and scared, and from struggling in school to becoming students full of joy, compassion, support, and most importantly, feeling part of their community. Uh, as a student, I also saw this research align with our studies in biological anthropology um, and in looking at gender through that lens. Finally, uh, when it comes to the information about the prophylaxis prep, uh, this is, I will quote one of my constituent, constituents, arming our students with the knowledge necessary to protect themselves is incredibly important. Therefore, I also support informing high school students about PrEP as an effective way of preventing HIV infection. It is because of these primary, primary issues that I'm asking you to approve the Family Life Education Curriculum Advisory Committee's FLECAG Majority Objectives as written. This is an area that I've witnessed doing international work as well as living in Washington, D.C. Not too far from here, we have a community that is still considered at high risk with more than 1% of the population currently living with HIV. However, in the past decade, they have seen a steep decline in that rate of infection due to access to resources, education, and now with a new campaign to ensure that people have access and information about the pre-exposure prophylaxis. I therefore fully support these recommendations and the others made to update our current curriculum, and I hope that my colleagues will share in supporting the FLECAC recommendations. The board will now consider a series of amendments, and um, I want to make sure that I have my colleagues' intent down pat. I will first recognize Mrs. Schultz for an amendment, and then I will recognize Mr. Wilson for an amendment to Mrs. Schultz's amendment. Okay, so the order of voting, uh, Mrs. Schultz will put her amendment on the table and speak to it, and whoever seconds it will speak to that. Then I will recognize Mr. Wilson for his amendment. We will vote on that amendment and then return to a vote on Mrs. Schultz's amendment. Okay, so that everybody understands the, the order in which that will come, correct? That is everyone's intent. Okay, I will call on Mrs. Schultz for your amendment. I move to postpone the board's vote on the FLECAC recommendations until the October 11th, 2018 regular meeting to prevent the board to have a presentation by staff on the public input and discussion at a work session. Seconded. Second. By Mr. Wilson. Um, Ms. Schultz, would you like to speak to your motion? Would you like us to speak to this motion now or wait? Well, that's what I, I give you. I, it was probably okay. better to let Mr. Wilson go ahead, if I, that's okay I'd with you. I'd rather he go ahead with his amendment. That's fine. Thank you. Then Mr. Wilson has a, an amendment to, these, to this amendment. Mr. Wilson. I move that the superintendent be directed to secure written permission for FLE instruction from all parents. Yeah. And is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Schultz. All right, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson, would you like to speak to your amendment? If we could please let board members speak. Please let Mr. Wilson speak. It is his opportunity to speak his mind on this amendment. Mr. Wilson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, um, I'd like to thank everybody who came out tonight um, for advocating for the various positions uh, that for changes or, or against the changes to the FLE program. Uh, the speakers um, uh, were really sort of amazingly eloquent uh, from our community on all sides. So thank you for all those getting involved and being here tonight. Uh, the, the reason for my amendment um, really is, uh, boils down to what I would say is an issue of, of fairness. Um, or I guess in the parlance of education, it's really equity. Um, it's a word that is used repeatedly um, by this board uh, and from the leadership team. 
I think we can all agree that we want all of our students in Fairfax County uh, to be treated fairly. We want an equitable school system. The problem is, as we have seen during this particular controversy, sometimes this board singles out groups for fair or equitable treatment, and in doing so, we treat adversely other groups of people. We are trying so hard to make sure that we are being fair to certain groups that we are completely ignoring other large groups of students and parents. I, I'm speaking about groups such as newly arrived immigrants, immigrant parents who do not speak English well or who are not yet familiar enough with American schools to even worry about the FLE lessons their children are being exposed to. These parents often do not know there is something that they should be concerned about. If you really believe in equity, you should consider these parents. A conservative Muslim family from Africa may be just as horrified as a conservative Catholic family from South America that their children are being taught about various types of sex, contraceptives, sex trafficking, and so on. It is simply not fair to say that the information is available online so these parents should be infor informed. It is not sufficient to assume consent simply because a parent failed to opt out. I would appreciate it if you would not interrupt Mr. Wilson. It is his opportunity to speak. We know that there are hundreds of languages represented among the families of our students. We know that many low-income students do not have regular access to computers or the internet. These families are trusting us to be fair to them and their children. It's also worth noting that children all develop at different rates. This is this is perhaps most evidence in the middle school years. If you have children of this age, you will be reminded of the vast range of development in this age group. You have kids who are really coming into their own and are ready to be teenagers. Then you have kids who are still playing with toys at home and collecting stuffed animals and watching cartoons. <clears throat> Among any age group, group, there are also vast differences and how children process information. For some kids, it's a big yawn to hear that some people are born into the wrong bodies. For others, this might spark a serious bout or a long-term bout of anxiety. Some kids could sit through a lesson on rape, incest, and sex trafficking and not bat an eye. Another child might have nightmares for weeks. Everyone, everyone is gonna be grossed out to have to talk about anal and oral sex in fourth period after lunch and before art class. But some kids will then promptly forget about it. Other kids will perseverate on the images in their mind for hours, for days or longer. Regardless of what you think of these topics, the problem is that for some kids and some families, they are disturbing. This is a fact. You can ignore it but it is there. If we develop an FLE program that is offensive to large groups of our student body and their, and their guardians and parents, then we are not being equitable. Some of the members of these groups are at least, are, are likely to be in a position to do something about it. Higher income families, for example, might pull their children out of FCPS altogether and opt for private religious school or homeschool their children. Lower income families, may not have these options. We are also not fairly considering the needs of students who are not developmentally ready to hear information or who are more sensitive or anxious to begin with. <laughs> Many people do not believe that all choices surrounding sexuality are equally good. They do, they do not want sensitive topics about sexual, sexually 
about sexuality discussed in front of their young children during school hours, they would like to be the ones instructing their children on issues of sexuality and family life. We have heard repeatedly from people who hold this position. Their position deserves a place in our school system, period. It is an unacceptable and unfair to a large amount of the population simply to ignore this position and treat the other positions as though they are the only ones. This position is held by many and it has long been held and is well-reasoned foundation in our society. To be fair, we need to recognize that people have different positions from the one that is reflected throughout the FLE curriculum. These are reasonable people with reasonable positions. Madam Chair. At, Madam Chair. Yes. Point of at, order. Um, yes, Mr. Moon does have a point of order, and that does take precedent uh, under Robert's rooms. Uh, Mr. Moon, if you would like to state your point of order. My point of order is I am trying to understand whether this is an amendment to a Mrs. Schultz's amendment because the language of the motion doesn't state that. And I, so I am trying, I think I can guess at it, but if we could use the exact language, how this amends Mrs. Schultz's amendment, because there's a certain way of crafting language, because I, I, ha I will have rely on the clerk to draft appropriate language connecting it to uh, the I, since, since you own this amendment yeah. rather than clerk, I mean, I, I want to get that the right language. Madam this, Chair, I think the point so is let me, if, clearly. If I, could, if I could finish it, uh, how this amends Mr. Schultz's amendment, that is what I want to know. It is an amendment in addition. So is that? It is an additional idea. You are, you are in the adding yes, additional yes. sentence to the Mrs. I, yes. Church's amendment. I think that's the way Madam Chair described it as well, Mr. Moon. Okay. Uh, that was what I'm sure trying to get, whether this substitutes Mr. Church's amendment as an amendment yeah. to amendment, or this is yeah, it's, adding it's to additional. Amend to add additional language. That's correct. Okay. I think if we could state that way, there will be, uh, okay. there will be more exact. Thank you. I will, I will accept Mr. Moon's suggestion. Mr. Wilson, we have the language ahead of us. If you can make sure that it is clear your intent. You did describe to me this afternoon your intent, but let's make sure that the language reflects that. Yeah, I apologize that it didn't get translated through to the clerk who prepares this motion. Um, but the motion is to add the following language to Mrs. Schultz's motion to move to amend and to direct the superintendent to secure written permission for FLE instruction from all parents. Can I, may I further clarify to make sure the record is straight? I move to amend the amendment to postpone to a date certain to add the following language, to direct the superintendent to secure, et cetera. Thank you, Madam I Chair. believe that that answers your point. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Then, Mr. Thank Wilson, you. were you uh, yeah, finished? I was, I, no, I was not finished. But um, okay, that's uh, go I, ahead and finish, well, I do and then I will call that, on the seconder. It is, uh, at this time, I'm not going to speak about at, about what should be done about our current FLE review process. Suffice it to say that the process is very broken. But one of the easiest things we could do would be to simply require parental consent before teaching FLE to, our ch to their children. Many children are sitting through FLE lessons by default because their parents did not see the material for whatever reason. We also have kids who won't turn their opt-out forms into their teachers for fear of being singled out. We also have an effort to put from some board members to put information that is currently in the FLE program into the health program so that nobody can opt out of it. We need to stop trying to hide this information from our parents. Parents should be allowed to choose the FLE curriculum for their students. Then we know their children are participating because they want them to be participating, not by accident or not by default. The bottom line is that parents should be the ones to decide if and when their children receive this information. I just want to make one more point. We need to listen to the community, even if we don't like what they are telling us. Thank you. 
please let Mr. Wilson finish. The views of the members of this board are not more important than the views of the parents of our children. I, I believe most of my constituents want this board and this school system to focus on education. I respectfully the, ask people not to interrupt the, the board member who is The speaking. FLE program is a very small part of what FCPS does every year, a system of obtaining written parental participation, per, permission would allow this board to focus on other matters. We can do better. I will ask if Mrs. Schultz would like to speak to her second on this amendment or not. It's up to you. Because we've been here before, and I don't want to um, find us hanking up the process by Robert's rules, um, Madam Chair, are we using this as a substitute motion to which we are speaking to this no, motion? No, we are. It is meant as an amendment to your amendment to add the language at the end of your motion. And, and if this and if this amendment fails, we go back to my your motion. motion. Absolutely, this does not preclude your Point original order, amendment. Chair. Sorry, when you finish. Yes, May if you have a question. I have a question. Um, Ms. Schultz's amendment, it looks like it should be a motion rather than an amendment? No, it is an amendment to the main motion. An amendment to the main motion. Yes, it's an amendment to the main motion. It's a motion to postpone. Just, just to postpone the entire That's right. The entire motion, okay. Yes, okay. All right, so Ms. Schultz, if you would like to speak to so it or not. I'm going to reserve the bulk of my comments um, because everything that's going to happen at this board table is preordained, just so you know. Um, All right, Ms. Hines. The, un the, un the, unfortunate, the, un the unfortunate reality is, is that the vote... The unfortunate reality is, is the vote total has already um, been made. Um, however, um, I will speak to this, that we are parents with partners, or partners with parents in the education of their children. We are not in charge of the child's education. Parents are. Ms. Hines, and we, like and when, excuse me. Oh, and I'm we, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, I thought you were done, go ahead. And I'm sorry, and when we seek as board members to um, circumnavigate or take a circuitous route around parents to achieve an objective, um, you naturally divorce parents from the education of their own child. Anything, anything that seeks to increase the collaboration of teachers and administrators in the delivery of um, education for the success um, and academic welfare of a child um, in partnership with parents is a good thing. And we should um, eagerly pursue um, the opportunity to improve and build um, stronger relationships with parents in the education of their children. And therefore, I will support this friendly amendment to my amendment. Ms. Hines, would you like to speak? Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Wilson, I'm sorry that this just came to us this morning. I have to be honest with you. Um, this has come up before in past years. I brought it up myself a few years ago just to ask the question because on the face of it, you sort of say, well, let's ask the question. Let's see. I mean, why couldn't we do it this way, right? And the answer I got is that it is very complicated. There's a lot to it. And so if, you, if we want to have an, a transparent and robust conversation about this, let's do that. But if we mean to do that, then we need to do it in a different forum and in a different way. We need to follow our usual process for that because we need to talk to school-based personnel the principals associations, our teacher associations. I'm a classroom teacher and I can tell you every time you have to chase a piece of paper, it takes time away from teaching kids. This is, to, to have to get forms returned by every child is a huge administrative burden. We don't do it for any reason. The only reason we do it is for, 
Please the only let reason, board members speak. We, we have to do it for um, our, I think it's our federal aid for our military families, and it's the impact aid. And it is, a, it, is, it is tremendous. Anyone who has worked in a classroom knows this. Anyone who's worked in a building knows this. And so when you, re when you see how few parents actually opt out, you have to ask yourself on balance, what is the better use of time? We also should speak to all the parents out there who don't want to have to chase themselves that extra piece of paper in September and are perfectly happy to have their children taught. The, we also should talk to uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Wilson, you rattled off a, a bunch of groups, religious groups, low-income families. I don't know, I, I would like to know, Mr. Wilson, what feedback you have had from all of those groups. If we need to speak to them about whether or not this is something we need to do, they are not here tonight. The people in this room, let me just make this clear. This room holds how many people? Roughly 300 people. This, this room holds roughly 300 people. This is a county of over a million. I represent 130,000 people in Hunter Mill, and I have no doubt that my constituents, the vast majority of my constituents in Hunter Mill, expect me to have this kind of conversation in a much better informed way than what we are able to do tonight. So I cannot support this, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Moon, do you like to speak? No. Please, I ask people not to interrupt. Mr. Thank Moon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Please, I don't want to have to clear the room. You are here to listen respectfully. Please let board members speak. Mr. Warren, Mr. Moon, Mr. Moon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have a couple of questions to ask of the staff. Sorry that I have not given you advance notice of the questions that I'll be asking you, but you should be able to answer these. So how long have we had opt-out procedure for FRE in Fairfax? Uh, my understanding is since the inception of having an FLE program as required by the Code of Virginia. 1980s. You mean opt-out procedure itself is required by Code of Virginia or FLE is required by State of Virginia? The uh, Code of Virginia, I have to look up the number, I think it's 22.1-207 um, says that parents have the right to excuse their child from FLE instruction. I'd have to look up the exact wording. I understand that parents do have a right to opt their children out of program, but whether, I am just trying to confirm that what I read uh, from Board of Education guidelines mm -hmm. and standards of learning for Virginia public schools and family life education. The most recent revision is September 2017. On page eight of that, in uh, section 1G, it states that on opt out procedure shall be provided. Is that your understanding about what the guideline is from the Board of Education? Yes, that's correct. The uh, Board of Education provides for an opt-out procedure. Thank you. We'll call on Ms. Evans, would like to speak. Actually, I was going to make the same point. I just looked this up, and uh, I, I uh, appreciate um, Mr. Wilson's comments. Um, we, it is important for us to listen to the community. Um, but I also looked up the same guidelines that Mr. Moon does, and my understanding of these guidelines is that it, uh, it requires opt-out. And um, until that changes, I, um, I, I, th I agree with uh, Ms. Vaticonda, by the way, that uh, one thing that we can perhaps do is be more detailed and find other ways for us to communicate with parents. Um, I appreciate Mr. Wilson's comment about parents who are new to this country, parents where there may be a language barrier, and um, I would certainly support anything that would uh, have us do better, a better job, perhaps a more thorough job of communicating what our lang uh, family life education involves, but I don't see um, a value to the opt-in versus the opt-out. I will call for a vote on Mr. Wilson's motion to amend the amendment to postpone. I'm sorry, would you like to speak one yeah, more time? Yeah, that's why I put my One more time, on. and then I will call okay, for the vote. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to respond to a couple of the questions, and, and I guess the, the first question really is a question for our um, 
general counsel, and, and I guess I would ask, can a school district, Mr. Foster, seek parental uh, permission uh, as I've, I've described it? Is that permittable under law? You know, Mr. Wilson, I would want to um, look into that. Having that question for the first time tonight, uh, I don't think it would serve the board's interest for me to answer it off the cuff. I mean, I've, I'm pulling up code sections here. Um, and, you know, as is mentioned earlier by Mr. Presidio, what the code provides with respect to FLE in particular is, uh, excuse me, regulation is opt out. Um, and I just, I'm reluctant to just shoot from the hip Sure. Thank, okay. thank you, right. uh, Mr. Foster. Then, Madam Chair, then I would request a slight modification to to my amendment to to add the language uh, to the extent permitted by law. So that we're we're assured that we're not asking the superintendent to do something that is illegal. Um, we want to make sure since our general counsel isn't able to answer the question of whether it's legal to ask permission, then we ought to add a, a clarifying phrase to my, my amendment to allow that we will only ask the superintendent to the extent it's permitted by law. Okay. I believe in order to do that, you have to, um, uh, you need to make a formal proposal to I, do that, oh, Mr. I, Wilson. I, I, I don't I know, want to belabor the. I, I don't want to belabor the administrative aspect of this. I, I am confident that it is permitted, and I think that in a general in a general sense, the superintendent is only allowed to do things in accordance with law. So I actually think that that's a general requirement of our superintendent that they operate the school systems right. in accordance for with the, law. For, so for so I, I will the withdraw meeting. the request. I was really just trying Thank to make you. the point that I do not think that there is any limitation on our ability to ask permission. After all. After all, we do require parental permission for field trips. We do require parental permission, parental permission for medications to be, to be provided and for going on field trips. We, but one of the things that I don't think we ask. Please, please <laughs> let school board members speak. I, I think that we can reasonably add to a form that already exists, which is the opt-out form that already goes home with every student every year, a sentence that provides that the parent can sign to give their permission for their student to participate in FLE. I don't think there's any, virtually any administrative burden on that. And we already require other papers to come back uh, to the school signed by, in fact, with regards to the SRNR, both the parent and the student, and that's regardless of that student's grade, because I've had four kids in the system, and many of my elementary school kids have had to scrawl their name on the SRNR form to get it turned in. Mr. Wilson, I'm going to begin to rule some of this out of order. Um, this is very difficult for you to continue to change your language I, at the board. Uh, Madam Chair, I've actually, I actually said I will no. not change it. I, this is this is very difficult. If you would like to continue uh, right. to amend it, you no, may. I, I, but I we not. need to vote on these one at a time now, so, rather than continuing to change uh, your language. Yeah, if you I, would like to, you can amend. You can offer another amendment at so, the table. But let us so vote Matt, on these one at a time. Please. Yeah, I don't think there's multiple changes. There's just my amendment. It's already posted there. Okay, and, and, let's and vote the conversation on that, I had with our general counsel was to discuss and clarify a concern that was raised okay. by another board member. Um, but just to be clear, we do not ask parents at what age they'd be comfortable having their daughter learn about oral sex. Right? And, 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 and that, Madam Chair, is something we should get a parental consent for, a permission. Okay. I'm going to call for a vote on this, and just for clarification, parents have the opportunity to opt out of all of family life education or any portion thereof. I will call for a vote on Mr. Wilson's motion, which I will read it again. I move to amend the amendment to postpone to a date certain to add the following language, direct the superintendent to secure written permission for FLE instruction from all parents. All those in favor? Mr. Wilson, Ms. Schultz, those opposed? It is Evans, McLaughlin, Palchek, um, McElveen, 
Corbett Sanders, Strauss, Moon, Pat Hines, Darren at Kofex, Keys Gamara. That motion fails. Please, I ask that people are quiet. I do not want to have to ask you all to leave. We need to wait. We need to make our way through. We need to make our way through this, these items. Thank you very much. We are back to Mrs. Schultz's motion. You now have the opportunity to speak to it. I have just had the pleasure of celebrating the many graduations of students with their parents and faculty. Some of the most accomplished students were highlighted, but also those who faced enormous physical, emotional, and academic challenges. Those crossing the threshold at commencement, particularly those with extraordinary uphill battles, had one thing in common, a committed cadre of adults, their parents, teachers, and administrators, and their counselors, working together to benefit the whole child. In each child's graduation was exemplified our best work. Good things happen when our priorities are right, when we focus on the success of children in the classroom and effectively work to support them in concert with their family. One of my favorite moments of the graduations was Principal Morris at Mountain View Alternative High School emotionally reading a letter written to his daughter about the many capabilities of his students graduating, despite having to have to persevere in so many ways. In the letter, he knit the stories of support by teachers and staff to students and their families in the accomplishment of the children and the qualities the children we are graduating into the world possess to his daughter's future as his most prized treasure. Another special moment was Principal Mukai having his entire pyramid of principals come together to share favorite quotes with graduates from a book, 365 Days of Wonder, precepts for life drawn from the book and movie of the same title. As they bid farewell to their former students, one elementary principal shared, you do not get harmony if everyone is singing from the same note. Most tre prized treasures, investment in children at the earliest age, academic support despite challenges to successfully graduate, and in each instance, joyous venues teeming with parents and extended family and friends to watch and cheer their child, their grandchild, godchild, niece, nephew, brother, or sister graduate. We have even had to move most of our high school graduations to the Eagle Bank Arena at George Mason University to accommodate parents and extended family and friends. We do all of this, not just to celebrate the students' accomplishments, but to honor parents and their role as the primary educator in guiding their own child's education. Then in parallel before us tonight is an action which is in stark contrast. The rights of parents and the role of a school system in educating a child are what are on the table tonight. The respect for the authority of parents in their role as the primary educator of their own children is central to any vote taken this evening. Other committees to this board on student health, advanced academics, minority student achievement, and other topics are currently presenting at this time of year their year-end reports to the board. Their members have stated in their presentations to the board things like, we have worked very hard to look at opposing viewpoints in order to come up with these recommendations. We have worked on some of these recommendations for years, and we have worked to secure research from other jurisdictions. Those reports of those committees have been open and transparent and been presented by the committee itself. The committees have reflected any concerns they had among their members in an honest manner and shared with the board and the superintendent what they saw as good in existing practices, where improvements could be made, and where they saw imperatives for change. They did public engagement in the community before they developed recommendations and brought them to the board. In contrast, the FLECAC report was presented by a staff member. The recommendations were not inclusive of any outreach or any public engagement, nor were they vetted by any means with parents and the community prior to being brought forward to the board. In fact, 
the large committee, 40 or so people, which is largely made up of superintendent appointees along with one appointee per board member and four appointees for the student representative, chose to formally vote to keep their individual votes secret. The committee members did not want to divulge if or how they voted on any of the recommendations. Subsequent to the presentation by staff of the committee's recommendations, a parent survey was sent out in the final 30 days of the school year. Despite the obstacle to overcome, given that there had been no public engagement by the school system with parents or with anyone in the community, the completed recommendations had already been presented to the board. Extraordinarily, there was public participation through the course of this online survey. The public comment period only closed last Friday. By that point, I had already attended four graduations for thousands of FCPS students. I imagine that in preparation for their son or daughter graduating, few had a time to consider any online public feedback on family life education. Days later, staff provided a 247-page document with some tallies of the comments that were received online. We have had no presentation by staff, there has been no analysis other than raw tallies, and there has been basically no time to read and discuss with each other, never mind with the public, the comments provided. Of the 1,318 comments, those that opposed either a single issue or changes in their entirety include 83% opposed changing biological sex to sex assigned at birth. 82, 82.5% opposed including instruction about PrEP um, to all high schoolers every year. 100% opposed removing abstinence as the only 100% effective means to pre prevent STIs. And 100% opposed removing clergy as a trusted adult in the ninth grade lesson. The Please let Mrs. The Schultz volume speak. of comments received on this set of FLE changes are a dramatic departure from comments received in previous years. The number of comments received this year is a 1,590% increase over last year. It is a 5,275% increase over the prior year before that. And in the year when we embarked on all of this is even a 235% increase in the number of comments received that year. This online survey participation mirrors engagement I have had with parents in the community. I have met with communities and parents from different backgrounds, cultures, and who speak different languages. I have spoken to those from every major faith tradition who have shared they are Presbyterian, Methodist, Episcopalian, Catholic, Jewish, Muslim, Sikh, and those actually who profess to be agnostic and even atheist. It is evident across all of these that a desire to be engaged and included in what their school system teaches their child about family life education is a shared view by all parents regardless of their background. Notably, the board has had no opportunity to authentically engage the community and each, uh, and each other about the parental consent and permission needed to teach the material in the FLE curriculum as evidenced by the prior vote. We require parents to provide uh, uh, signatures and affirmatively sign consent and give their permission for a number of aspects of a child's education. High school course selections for every high school student emergency care cards, prescription medication sheets, acknowledgement of the student rights and responsibilities, the very same SNR and r we're gonna approve later tonight, field trip permission slips, and more. In fact, a mom shared a story from just this week. Her daughter's third grade principal teacher called home and said that she had not turned in a signed form opting her child in or out of the strings or band class for next year. The vice principal had sent home two forms with lots of information on these music lessons. 
but neither had been returned. So they were not certain of her permission for her daughter to be exposed to music lessons. She asked me, so you need, she asked the teacher, so you need my signed informed consent prior to any movement on letting my daughter have or have not music lessons? The answer was yes. The moral of the story is that the failure of a parent to opt out does not equal informed consent. As a board, As a board, we should be willing to ask parents to sign permission affirmatively that their students be allowed to take FLE, not to wait for signatures from those who have the ability to figure out how to opt them out. We should have the discussion with parents and make policy based on and in concert with the parents, not in place of them or despite them. We need time. We need time to discuss the implications of these FLE recommendations, the formal results that were just delivered in the open comment period that just closed days ago, and the additional comments received outside the formal public comment. It was an overwhelming rate of somewhere between eight to one to 100% and deliver an education to children which respects the rights of parents and the role of the public whom we are supposed to represent. Without authentic engagement to engage parents, we are merely threading the needle and claiming what we have done meets the requirements of the Virginia standards, which state in part, there must be evidence of broad-based community involvement and an annual opportunity for parents and others to review the curriculum prior to the beginning of actual instruction. An annual survey conducted online after the recommendations are already developed, voted on by the committee, and presented to the board is not broad-based community involvement. Please continue, we, Ms. Cole. We are, we are public servants charged with upholding the law and seeking the best policy for the academic success of students. We do not have the right to use this office to usurp the authority of parents as the primary educators of their own children. The conversation still needs to be had with the public and is reflective of the reminder that no harmony exists if there's only one note. There is no harmony on this issue because the symphony of voices of parents is missing. Please support this amendment. Mr. Wilson, would you like to speak to your second? Please let Mr. Wilson speak. Please let Mr. Wilson speak. Mr. Wilson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I um, seconded this um, motion made by uh, Ms. Schultz um, because of the overwhelming public comment that was received. Um, uh, I asked, this is a binder of the, of the nearly 247 pages of comments that were received during the comment period, um, which I would um, uh, guess that none of my college have been able, colleagues have been able to even read through, let alone have conversations about. I certainly did not this week with graduations, my own son graduating uh, and preparing for a graduation party uh, in addition to many other commitments. Um, but I mentioned in my initial remarks that the Family Life Education Curriculum Advisory Committee is very broken. And one of the numbers that I think points this out um, with extreme clarity is that when the public comments were submitted, the 100% of the public comments opposed a decision by the Family Life Education Curriculum Advisory Committee by a vote of 23 to three in favor. There was literally 180 degrees diametric opposition between what the committee which is supposed to reflect our community, believed, and what the community, when asked to give comments, provided. And, and I know that is almost, it, it's almost too hard to, it's almost too shocking of a number to believe, but in fact, 100% of the community objected to the recommendation that we removed clergy um, from the list of, of um, <laughs> from, the, from the FLE curriculum. And, I'm sure my colleagues later will put that back in because 100% of the community told them no. But we shouldn't get to that point where we have to get 
a public comment period where 100% of the people tell us, hey, you're heading down the wrong path before we make a change. We need to listen, we need to acknowledge, and we need to do what we can to reflect the opinions of our community. Um, Ms. Evans, did you wish to speak to this? Ms. Evans? Thank you. Um, I am going to oppose this amendment. Um, I do want to remind people that this is that the, the amendment is to postpone uh, a decision until October. And um, that's simply not necessary. I wanted to go through where we have been with this. A year ago, the school board asked the family, the FLECAC committee to review the entire curriculum. And our uh, FLECAC committee is to be commended for their very, very thorough job that they did on it. My own, uh, I've been in touch with my own appointee who's been on that committee for more than a decade. And I particularly appreciate uh, her, her work on that committee. Um, so we usually, I wanted to remind uh, those who watch the, the school board that typically we put something on as new business at one board meeting and at the next board meeting we vote on that. We put it on as new business so people can review and then uh, at the next board meeting we, we typically have it as an action item. In the case of uh, family life education, we posted this more than a month ago on May 10th, uh, so the public could have more time to review it, so we could have more time to review it. We ha had a very thorough discussion at our work session on May 14th as well. That It was at that, um, during that conversation that several of us uh, agreed that there was no reason to um, uh, remove the word clergy and other trusted adults. The, there were other things on that list that the committee had suggested they perhaps could could remove simply to, to clean up the language, but there was no real reason, some of us believe in, uh, to remove that. So I will be supporting Mr. Moon's amendment um, later, later on in this process. But my point on this amendment is that we have had quite a bit of opportunity. We have had more review of this than we uh, typically do. We have been hearing from our communities. We've been hearing, and thank you for, for all of you who've come out. Uh, you're, it's important that you uh, voice your view, no matter what your view is, no matter what your perspective is, um, and it's important that we hear from all of you, but we have heard from all of you, and we have been for many, many months. Uh, we've had quite a few emails, and um, we've heard speakers uh, for months. We've been uh, having speakers come, and thank you for taking the time uh, to do that. But I believe that we have had plenty of opportunity to hear from the community. Yes, we did get a report um, that uh, both summarized the community comments and gave us all of the co community comments as well. They very closely mirror uh, what we have heard over over quite a few months. So I believe that we have had ample opportunity to review this important topic, and I do not support delaying. Please, people, give board members the opportunity to speak. Uh, next I will call on Ms. Corbett Sanders. Yes. Um, Thank you, Ms. Evans, for setting the, the stage of how we got here. Because this is a, um, a situation where we actually began this process over a year ago. And we began it uh, with a discussion in a forum that um, talked about what was in the health curriculum versus what was in the family life education curriculum and whether or not our family life education curriculum reflected an inclusive um, community and the, what needed to be in um, family life versus health, uh, as well as ensuring that people that had the time and the capability to do a deep dive on what was in the curriculum and have those robust discussions. And so that's what happened, is we referred this to the Family Life um, Education Curriculum Advisory Committee. That is an advisory committee to the superintendent and not to the school board, although... Please let board members speak. Although, um, the, and that is why 
the superintendent and his staff presents the report to the full board. It is not an advisory committee to the, to the school board. Secondly, the makeup of that advisory committee. I can assure you that um, my appointee is somebody who is a mom, who um, is a grandmother, who has children in the schools, and takes her role very seriously. So seriously that she not only focuses on her own review, but reaches out to community members and talks about it. I've also, despite what some might say, um, have spent time in my community talking to community members and faith-based leaders in the community. Faith-based faith leaders that represent all different religions and all different approaches to how they have a relationship with their uh, congregations as well as um, how they encourage their members of their congregation to, um, to develop their own faith. So this is one where I believe pretty strongly that we've done the um, consultation with the community. We've spoken to our members in the community. Um, that is what each one of us does as individuals, as well as having a robust discussion about all the same topics that we're going to talk about tonight at a work session. Please, audience. And so I would urge that um, we don't continue to um, delay, but that we um, go ahead and adopt the uh, report with the amendments that are being discussed tonight. If Ms. Ms. McLaughlin, and then I will call for the vote. Mr. Wilson. Okay, and that will be the last go back. I will call for the vote, Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, I, I want to uh, reinforce um, the comments shared by uh, Ms. Evans and Ms. Corbett Sanders. Um, this board did, at its work session, talk about um, the merits of maintaining um, the term clergy um, in the language. So even though it was recommended by FLE, again, from a streamlined point of view, that once you start to name off you know, trusted adults that, you know, that the kids should think of, then maybe you're going to forget others that you should um, cite in there. And as a social worker, I absolutely believe it's important that we encourage young people um, to reach out and talk to trusted adults, and it may go beyond just one's parents or loved ones. And so it was Mr. Moon at that work session who said, um, for many families and for many young people, clergy or a trusted counselor is someone that we would like to go ahead and still maintain in our language. And so that is something that um, is here tonight, and it's not simply because um, it, it took only the community input that Mr. Wilson just um, cited, but it was something that the board was very mindful of and, and did speak about just over a month ago. Um, the other thing that uh, I wanted to speak to in terms of Ms. Schultz's um, amendment um, before us is that um, it's evident um, in the six and a half years I've been on the school board um, that we not only represent a diverse community of 1.1 million plus people, but you also have 12 elected officials and on many different issues we're going to have a diversity of perspective as well. And I will tell you that in my time on the board what has been most important to me is that I show professional respect and courtesy to every single one of my colleagues, even if I see something in uh, and, and a different point of view. And so when it comes to this issue here before us tonight, I think something that we've lost, and I'm going to ask Dr. Brabrand as our, our superintendent, who's just getting his first year under his belt, is we need to do better for our community when it comes to the FLE annual recommendations in that. As leaders, we need to reassure you that when we take the recommendations coming from our FLECAC, who are devoted, well-intentioned volunteers, who spend a lot of time reviewing the information and giving us their best recommendation. But just like as Ms. Schultz noted, 
with every advisory committee, we do then look to our superintendent and we look to the subject matter experts who make up part of his administration. And when it comes to these recommendations that we are looking at here tonight, this board doesn't take lightly that we're just going to vote where the loudest voices came in. As Ms. Ms. Hines noted, uh, she's got 130,000 people in her district alone. Yes, we heard from several hundred people in the, in the community input period, and, and, that, and even, even with thousands, it's not the 1.1 million we have in our community. So that, again, helps to inform the board and understand where our community is. But in the end, I believe that when I was elected to this school board, the, the residents of Braddock District wanted me to focus on how do we find best practice and how do we ensure that what we bring to the, the educational instruction to our children is based on that best practice. And so at that work session a month ago, I specifically asked our staff, I said, I, I want to take the heat off of the Fleet Hack Advisory Committee. It's not fair to the Fleet Hack Advisory Committee. They brought recommendations forward, and yes, that's what's being described here tonight, but it comes with the support and the endorsement of this superintendent and his subject matter experts. And it, and it is from those individuals who know this subject matter far better than, yeah. As, uh, Please let school board members speak. Please. As a, as, a, as a school division, we look to our administrators as educational experts. We certainly do respect parents. And one of the beauties of FLE, one of the beauties of the FLE is that it is an opt out because we do want to respect our families, that if you feel that this material is too sensitive for you to have your children learning in a school setting, you should have the ability to opt your child out. And as, it sta as, shared, as shared by our staff, we do then give them non-FLE health instruction so that those students will still have the benefits of learning. If our school division um, as we always should look to ways to continuously improve. I welcome that, absolutely. But as of now, I do believe that the voters here in Fairfax County, the residents here in Fairfax County, want to ensure that this board of 12 is going to make our decisions not based on, on simply community input alone, but what do our educational experts tell us is the best way to deliver instruction and families can then make choices. And so for that reason, I'm not going to be voting to delay okay, it this there time. There are two more, there are more go backs. There, I will recognize a brief go back for Mr. Wilson and Mrs. Schultz, and then we will come to a vote. There are more amendments to consider and more conversation that will be in order. So Mr. Wilson, a brief go back, and Mrs. Schultz, a brief go back. Uh, thank Mr. you. Wilson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess the first thing I'd, I want to add, my two cents on the history of this as well. Um, in fact, um, in 2016, one of the board members on the board, uh, Jeanette Huff, uh, uh, came to a uh, forum, which is our uh, uh, meeting where we, it's a public meeting at which time we talk about topics that could come forward to the board. And she put forward a proposal that the board should hold a work session or multiple work sessions where we could we could secure public input and review the new curriculum which had already incorporated many many changes that that are being discussed tonight uh, the board at that time decided to send it uh, to the family life education curriculum advisory committee um, at the time, of course, I had no experience with the Family Life Education Committee and didn't know who was on it. Um, but I have to say that, and as I've said this earlier, that committee is broken. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, you know, in addition to some of the other comments that have been made, um, I would like to remind people that reasonable people holding reasonable beliefs and opinions that are long held in our community are, are their, their interests are at stake in this discussion. And, and here's, what, here's what appeared to be happening. It appears that there 
uh, are numerous committee members who are openly hostile to people of faith and dis display hateful religious bigotry. While religious bigotry is an American freedom, religious discrimination is not allowed in our school-related activities, including committee meetings and members. Uh, and I, 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 just, I just think that it's important to understand that, when I'm, that you can't just toss out reasonableness when you say, well, they also are a person of faith. Because that definition includes probably more than half of Fairfax County residents. Their opinions matter, they have children in our schools, and we need to respect their rights. And we can do a little bit better simply by giving us a little more time to discuss this as a community. And so I will support the extension. Ms. Schultz. Um, m one of the most uh, egregious um, recommendations um, to eliminate and remove clergy as a trusted visual under the guise that, well, it's covered someplace else, so we don't actually need to list this um, um, title anymore under trusted individuals. We're gonna pull clergy out. is gonna appear in a later amendment. Um, because there was such a visceral reaction in the community. But if, and as I said, stated earlier, of those who provided comments on an individual issue or the overarching issue in the online survey, 100% of the people who provided a comment on the specific issue said that they did not agree with removing clergy. But also that same uh, statistic applies to removing abstinence. Um, as a, the only 100% effective me method of providing um, sexually transmitted um, diseases and infections. Well, if we're going to amend for clergy, then why wouldn't we also amend for abstinence? I don't know where the threshold is. If 100% is the threshold, 100% is the threshold. But for some reason, we're only going to call out that one change. Um, is 83% not good enough or 82.5% of the respondents? Is 8 to 1 on parent input not good enough for us to listen to? Because I will tell you, the most important educational experts that we should be listening to are parents. Um, Ms. Keyes Gamara has asked to speak, and she has not had an opportunity to speak yet, so I will call on you, and then we will call for the vote. Ms. Keyes Gamara. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just wanted to ask staff, because Ms. Schultz just mentioned abstinence, and I know that we've had some extensive discussions as to why um, it has been recommended that that is not the most accurate term, so I'm not sure if whether Ms. Payne or Mr. Sloan would like to speak to that as to the reasoning behind um, that particular recommendation. Um, so there are other ways that um, sexually transmitted infections can be transmitted, not just through sexual activity, such as um, during childbirth, breast milk, um, uh, and other avenues. In the curriculum where infections are strictly transmitted sexually, that will still be part of the curriculum wherever it's appropriate and where there are other modalities that may occur that transmit it, we provide that information as well. So am I correct in my understanding that that particular phrase was deemed to not be the most accurate description of how these diseases are transferred? Correct, okay. for, some, for some of these infections, there are multiple ways beyond sexually transmitted. Okay, I will call for the vote on uh, Mrs. Schultz's motion to postpone to a date certain, which is October 11th. That is the motion on the table. All those in favor? Mr. Wilson, Ms. Schultz, those opposed? It is Evans, Polchek, McElveen, Sanders, Strauss, Moon, Hines, O. McLaughlin, Thank you, um, Derenek Kofex, Keys Gamera. That motion fails. I will call on Mr. Moon for an amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to strike the second to the last sentence in 9.6 HGD, which stands for Human Growth and Development in the recommended lesson objective changes for grade nine 
and replace it with the following sentence. Students with questions or concerns about, about their sexual orientation or gender identity will be advised to talk with a parent or other trusted adults, such as members of the clergy and healthcare providers. Second, second by Ms. Corbett Sanders. Um, uh, Mr. Moon, would you like to speak to your motion? And I, I remind my colleagues to tend your lights, Mr. Moon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just briefly, as uh, some other board members have already, you know, brief, already touched upon why, you know, when I initially proposed uh, this amendment, it was, you know, about a month ago when this first came up for discussion, and I was not the only one. Uh, even though I might, you know, I brought it up first, there were all, you know, there wasn't any other board member who, you know, disagreed with me. They were all supportive of this, and I wanna, I wanna thank. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ms. Perchek, at the time, you also suggested me to include healthcare providers as a part of my proposed amendment, and I appreciate that. That is why I have that one. I fully understand the intent behind uh, the FLICX recommendation about trying to clear up the language, trying to simplify the language, but at the same time, that might, I thought that that might have created uh, an undesirable misunderstanding that we're not respecting we're not respecting members of a clergy. So uh, in order to avoid that, I want the members of a, language of a members of a clergy back into the lesson objective. That's what my a, a amendment is uh, trying to achieve. Ms. Corbett Sanders, would you like to speak to your second? Sure, thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Moon, for bringing this to the uh, work session. I think all of us, uh, it was a unanimous vote at the work session that we thought this was a good idea. I just want to talk a little bit about family life education and how it's changed over the years to reflect a more inclusive society that our community is becoming here in Fairfax County, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and nationally. This inclusivity is a good thing because it values every person for the person they are and not by their appearance, their sexual orientation, their gender, or the places they worship. We don't call this curriculum sex education because it is more about, it is about more than just cohabitation. It is about making healthy life choices so that our students can grow into adulthood and obtain and reach their potential as human beings and contribute to their community. However, none of us can do this alone. We are social beings that require support from our family and trusted members of our community. All of, us, all of us have times in our lives when we seek guidance from others. It is in those times that I believe and have experienced personally a member of the clergy is the trusted adult to which a student should turn to. As we wrestle with these very difficult issues before us, I have been touched by the number of members of the clergy from across the religious spectrum that have reached out and voiced their support for the needs of our students. Clergy play an important role in guiding our youth and provide supports for them during that period in their lives when they are testing independence from their parents and defining who they are as individuals. It is because of that trusted relationship that a member of the clergy may be best suited to reinforce the importance of the family, understanding one's own role in society and how to make good decisions, and the values of forgiveness of oneself and others when we make mistakes, as well as guidance on human sexuality and committed relationships in the context and values of one's religion. And so I very happily support this uh, amendment. Ms. Palchuk, did you wish to speak? Yeah, just very briefly, I appreciate Mr. Moon adding uh, healthcare providers to your amendment. Um, I do uh, agree with my colleagues that it is very important for our students to have multiple uh, adults that they can turn to. Um, I also want to add that one of the reasons I, I will not support um, opting out is because we've heard about the families who are assuming that families and immigrants like my own will naturally want to opt out and will be left out um, and are being left out of, a, of an opt out um, portion of doing this. I think it's really important to understand that there are families on both sides and families, diverse families on both sides of the issue. Um, in addition, that there are different places that students can turn to for support. As a young woman, um, I, I received a lot of guidance from my clergy. Uh, however, in order, whenever it was 
issues related to this curriculum, it was to a healthcare provider that I felt more comfortable to turn to. And so I think it's very important if we want to clarify and add back in some of those adults that students can turn to that um, we do include both clergy and healthcare providers. And I do appreciate all of the clergy who are here tonight um, and those who work in the community to support our students and our families, uh, especially those who maybe do not have extended family nearby. And, and so I will support this with that inclusion. Thank you, Mr. Moon. Thank you. I'll call for the vote on Mr. Moon's amendment, which adds back in um, uh, other trusted adults, such as members of the clergy and healthcare providers. All of those in favor? That motion is unanimous with Mr. Wilson away from the table. I will call on Mr. Moon for another amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to strike the last sentence in 10.6, uh, Human Growth and Development, in the recommended lesson objective ch changes for grade 10 and replace it with the following sentence. Students with the questions or concerns about their sexual orientation or gender identity will be advised to talk with a parent or other trusted adults such as members of the clergy and healthcare providers. Is there a second? Second by Ms. Corbett Sanders. Um, Mr. Moon, would you like to speak to I, I don't think I need to repeat the same thing that I had already said. Okay, this is simply um, putting the language back in at the appropriate lesson in grade 10. All those in favor of this amendment? That motion is unanimous with Mr. Wilson away from the table. Thank you, that passes. Next, I will call on Ms. Corbett Sanders for an amendment. I move to amend lesson objectives 10.7, 11.3, and 12.1 to add instruction will include bystander awareness and intervention strategies. Is there a second by Mr. McElveen? Would you like to speak to your motion? Ms. Corbett yes. Sanders. Thank you, Chairman Strauss. Statistically, one in five women and one in 67 men will be raped or experience an attempted rape in their lifetime. Even more will experience sexual harassment as has been demonstrated in the numerous stories being shared in the Me Too movement. Oftentimes, these incidents occur within eyeshot of bystanders who know the victim or the aggressor or do not know what, they, what to do. They choose not to intervene. The reason they choose not to intervene are well documented to include they did not recognize the signs of an ongoing assault, they did not want to call attention to themselves or breach social norms, they expected someone else to step in. However, what we know from 20 years of research is that bystander intervention is an important step in changing the paradigm of preventing sexual assault and violence from a problem for the victim and the perpetrator to the broader community. Bystander education has been associated with decreased rates of sexual assaults on college campuses, many of which introduced the programs because of Title IX violations. Others introduced programs in the aftermath of tragedies that occurred in their communities. One such is UVA in the aftermath of Hannah Graham's abduction and murder. Hannah's, pa Hannah's parents worked with the UVA administration to introduce bystander training on campus. Last year, her mother approached me about introducing these programs at an earlier age in the high school curriculum. We met with Dr. Payne and shared the research that has shown that introducing these programs in high school uh, decreases assaults. I was glad to see that this was taken up by the Fleet CAC and introduced in the ninth grade curriculum. However, studies show that to be most effective, the education needs to be included in all four years of a student's high school career. And so therefore, I would like to see this introduced. Thank you. Mr. McElveen, would you like to speak to your second? Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair. So um, over the past year, or at least past six months, this board has been laser focused on the issues of sexual harassment and assault, just like many of us in society. Um, and uh, this year, you know, through work sessions and other methods, we've been working with staff to find other ways to um, educate our students on these issues. Um, and I'm particularly grateful to uh, Ms. Cor Corbett Sanders for bringing this forward and finding this omission in, in, the, um, uh, in this uh, document. And so I'm glad we're adding it back in. Um, I'm also grateful for your work with, with the Graham family. I do believe that um, Fairfax does bear some responsibility um, for the Hannah Graham incident because we did not have programs that trained our students on, on um, 
uh, how to how to self defend and how to um, handle issues of bystander awareness. So this, the more we can educate our students on this at the um, high school level, the better they will be prepared for um, future. Ms. Schultz? Yeah, I just, I guess I have a question. If this conversation was had over a year ago, then why didn't the family life education staff and committee consider this? I mean, why is this I mean, it, it's not that this isn't good language, but we're literally creating a, a, a what, you're, sh you're shaking your head no, but why wasn't it in the recommendations from the committee is my question. Ms. Schultz, it was just for ninth grade. And what we've found is studies uh, show that's, that- But that's my question is, is that, you know, on the one hand, all the arguments this evening have been, we need to relinquish our, our understanding to the people who are the experts. But now we're sitting at the table saying, oh, no, 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 the experts say that it's all four years. And I don't disagree. I think that's actually a common sense um, discussion to be had at the table. But the irony is, is that when, when this board discusses things at the last minute, depending upon who discusses them, then it's like, oh, well, we just got this amendment today, we can't possibly discuss it. And this was something that for a year was before the committee, and we're relinquishing and relying on subject matter experts, and yet the committee and our experts staff didn't recommend it for all four years. And so this is, you know, a, an icing on the cake to, to make this um, uh, this information available to all four years, but there is a dissonance that we decide at the table that this is what's best. Now we're substituting our judgment for the committee, we're substituting our judgment for the subject matter experts on staff, and we're deciding extemporaneously based on, yes, common sense, but we're deciding. So we just, we can't jive the logic of what has been discussed up until this point this evening, and then all of a sudden say, but on this one thing, on this one thing, we know better. We know better than the committee, and we know better than parents, and we know better than the subject matter experts on staff. So uh, it's just, it, it's an unfortunate irony on something that is such common sense. I don't believe that we bear responsibility for something that happened at UVA. I do think that we can learn from what has happened in our community and certainly what has happened here in our community. And that's why this makes sense. But unfortunately, the logic behind it is, is severely flawed. Um, Ms. McLaughlin. I just want to thank Ms. Corbett Sanders for bringing this forward. What we do know about um, brain research is that uh, oftentimes it takes hearing the information um, in multiple settings in order for um, the brain to uh, store it into long-term memory. And so the ability of delivering this important information over four years only means to reinforce something that's extremely important. Also, the maturity level of a student learning this lesson, less than as a freshman in high school, and then as they develop more life awareness, they get to 10th grade, they get to 11th grade, the 12th grade, the, these, this reminder and this reinforcement of how important it is uh, to look at things like bystander awareness and intervention strategies, it's, it's imperative. And, and while I appreciate what Ms. Schultz is saying about are we now substituting our our own decision making in, in place of staff and FLECAC. Uh, I'll reiterate about all of my votes here this evening. Um, at any given time, our superintendent, who this board hired and said, you are to operate this school system along with your staff and administration. If they disagreed with Ms. Corbett Sanders' amendment and gave their evidence-based uh, rationale for why this would be a bad thing, then I think we would be having that conversation at the board table. But they don't disagree with her. It, from what I understand, they saw it as just an improvement to lessons we're already doing, just offering them in the successive years. And so um, for this, I feel very comfortable supporting it. Ms. Cor uh, Ms. Keyes, Kamara. 
Yes, I, I thank um, Ms. Corbett Sanders for bringing this forward. Um, as Mr. McElveen mentioned, we have uh, gone through a lot this year with respect to uh, issues impacted by sexual assault and really coming into a greater understanding of what used to be okay, but we are now, women are now coming forward and saying it's not okay anymore. And we have to, we do have to go to the additional lengths to make sure that we really are questioning, we really are trying to enhance our, um, our academic presentation to, to bring each of us to a, to a higher place. And so I appreciate this. I, I also appreciate Ms. Schultz's comments because I, I do think that we need to question why we're doing what we're doing. But I wanted to speak up to say I absolutely support this for that reason. We are in the process. Uh, we have dealt with this issue of, uh, of sexual inappropriateness a lot this year. We are in the process of a cultural change and I think that this is important for us to really talk about how we can contribute in a more positive way. So I fully support this. Thank you. Okay, I will call for the motion. Um, the amendment on uh, Ms. Corb is introduced to um, add instruction will include bystander awareness and intervention strategies in 10.7, 11.3, and 12.1. All those in favor? That motion is unanimous with Mr. Wilson away from the table. Now we'll call on Ms. Keys Gamara for an amendment. However, I think we need to add a little clarifying language here. Um, and Madam Clerk, because part of the recommendation in FLECAC was to put into the health curriculum um, uh, the recommendations for opioid and heroin. And your amendment is to the health curriculum. Correct. Yes, and so I, to be clear, so that we understand, and I know that was your intent. So, Madam Clerk. Because this is sort of a point of order. Uh, if, I, if I could. Yes, if we could, just we need to be clear. Yeah, and I, and I do not want to confuse the issue at all. Yes, can um, you just But just as a point up? of clarification, yes. the actual FLECAC recommendation was to include instruction on those topics within our curriculum. Right. Not necessarily within the health curriculum, because health curriculum is not delivered at the 11th and 12th grade. So the recommendation was for us to find the appropriate place in the curriculum at the 11th and 12th grade to deliver this instruction. Are you, you mean with um, Ms. Keys Gamara's amendment? Yes. Could you add the appropriate language as to? I, I think the original language was fine, um, and that will direct staff to determine the appropriate place. Okay, but we need, we, need, we need some clarifying language here. Okay. Yes. Can we just staff a moment so that we understand exactly where this amendment fits. Either a page number. So uh, again, if I could, I, I would just suggest that the original language, which reads as follows, I move to amend lesson objectives 10.7, 11.3, and 12.1. That's, that's the one I just did. I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm no. sorry. This is an, in, in Mrs. Keys Gamara. I, I amendment. understand. I'm sorry. I was reading. Dealing. The yeah. This is fine. We're 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 past that. We're okay. Yeah. This is dealing with opioid heroin right. use, and I believe that that has been moved into the health curriculum. The language that we have now is does that is that clear what it what is being amended? Because I yes, believe it's what, the what, health. What she wants to amend is that the original recommendation from FLECAC said that, you know, opioid heroin prevention is really important and we and they did not want it instructed through FLE. Exactly. So it is so been this moved is, into the health. So it's just to be instructed somewhere in eleventh and twelfth grade because there is no health requirement in 11th and 12th grade. So it would have to be done somewhere, 
um, to be determined. Like family life education is currently instructed through social studies courses in 11th and 12th grade, not through a health curriculum. So while it is health curriculum, it would have to, we have to find some content area somewhere to put it in. Her, uh, Ms. Keys Gamara's motion is to expand the content beyond opioids and heroin to include other could substances. We, could you slow down and give that language? Because we need to be clear as to what. Can I just point. offer a suggestion that it just says, um, I move to amend the main motion to amend the recommendation for opioid and heroin use prevention in the 11th and 12th grades to include alcohol, tobacco, vaping, cigarettes, and other drugs of addiction. Okay, is that, all right, because we, we just need to clarify where this is going. Okay? I just need to make sure that's appropriate for staff. I mean, yes. Okay. Yes, because this then goes into the curriculum so that we know <laughs> where it's coming. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for, your, for, my, for indulging me. I need to make sure this was clear. All right. Now, Ms. Keys Kamara, would you like to yes. put this on the floor for discussion? Yes, Madam Chair. I move to amend the main motion to amend the recommendation for opioid hero heroin use prevention in the 11th and 12th grades to include alcohol, tobacco, including vaping, cigarettes, and other drugs of addiction. Thank you. Is there a second? Seconded by Ms. McLaughlin. Um, uh, Ms. Kieskmeyer, would you like to speak to it? Yes. Um, first of all, I, I welcome this discussion. Um, as an advocate for children, I am dealing with the lack of understanding of um, substance abuse on a regular basis. I was concerned, however, about limiting it to opioid and heroin only because that is not what I am seeing in practice. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that we are more fully directing the, uh, addressing the issue of substance abuse in a realistic and practical way so that our children can be educated uh, rather than getting caught up in something that they didn't recognize could ruin their lives, which is essentially what, what it can do. And so for that reason, I simply wanted to broaden the discussion because that is the reality that I have encountered in my everyday work. Thank you. Ms. McLaughlin, did you want to speak to that as a seconder? Yes. Um, like Ms. Keys Gamara, um, I have also, um, in my background as a social worker, uh, working with um, juveniles and families, and issues like addiction um, are tragic in their impact on families, and it goes far beyond opioid and heroin. And so I just welcome an opportunity um, for this school system to um, broaden um, this, the awareness among our students and hopefully among our families as a result. So I want to thank her for uh, bringing this uh, additional language um, t for us uh, tonight. And I, I do believe it's going to um, improve upon our efforts um, in helping our students and families. Mr. Nakofax, did you wish to speak? Yes, um, I, I'll be supporting this, and I appreciate, again, uh, Ms. Keys Kamara bringing this to our attention and expanding it. But I do have a question of staff. I know there are many other times in the health curriculum where we talk about the um, perils, <laughs> if you will, of overindulging in alcohol, um, tobacco, and we're adding the vaping. Can you tell us what grades that happens in? In the uh, health curriculum. We begin the substance use prevention curriculum in kindergarten where we start with medications, uh, prescription, non-prescription. Uh, we start introducing tobacco, I believe, in second grade. I'd have to look it up. And then and do tobacco, alcohol, and we continue to scale that up. We add inhalants, um, as we know by the youth survey. as a real issue at the middle school level. The middle school level, we also introduce um, opioids um, and other a variety of other um, substances. So it's a scaffolded curriculum K through 10. K through 10. Okay. So yeah, I, I do really appreciate this then because I, I do think um, 
you know, particularly in the high school years, um, some of these things, you, you quit learning about it in 10th grade, and I think it needs to be reinforced throughout. So if we can add this to the FLE curriculum in a broader sense, um, I appreciate that Fleek Hack adding opioid and heroin, and I appreciate you adding the broader um, addictive type of drugs and behaviors. So thanks. Uh, Ms. Evans, did you wish to speak to this? Uh, really just a question. I, I just want to make sure I understand what we're we're doing and um, with so the the recommendation and what's included here already is to add op opioid heroin at the 11th and 12th grade level in FLE. Is that correct? That the current the current it would FLE. be out the recommendation to do it outside of FLE so that all students can access it. I'm sorry. Say that again, please. It would be to do this substance use prevention instruction outside of family life education so that all students would access the information. And so where would it be? That is, with your support, that will be something that I will work with um, So others. we don't know at, at this point At this point, that decision hasn't been made because... Because they don't have health and we don't want it in FLE, correct? Correct. Okay, so this will be in an, un, at this point, undesignated curriculum, but we, so all, all Ms. Keys Gamara you're doing is adding to that, that in, in whatever curriculum staff chooses, that we will also include alcohol, tobacco, vaping, et cetera. Okay. Okay. I, I guess well, I, I would have yeah. a little bit more comfort if we knew already where it was going to go, uh, you know, what, but. Um, if I may clarify, of course. It, it was initially opioid and heroin only right. going to this place to be determined. Okay. My concern is that when we raise, when we mention those, yes. er, those particular drugs, mm -hmm. we, we elevate the importance. And all substance abuse is the true, in, true enemy. Right. And I, I, I don't want there to ever be even an implied deception there. Mm -hmm. And so that is the reason I'm simply expanding what was already recommended. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I appreciate that clarification, and uh, with that, I can support this. Okay, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor of Ms. Keys Gamara expansion at the 11th and 12th grade to include, in addition to opioid and heroin, uh, also alcohol, tobacco, vaping, cigarettes, and other drugs of addiction. Did you have something else that you needed to add? No. All right, we're getting ready to vote. All right, all those in favor? That motion is unanimous with um, Ms. Schultz and Mr. Wilson and Mr. Nikofax away from the table. Thank you. Uh, now we are back to the main motion as amended. The amendments that have been made so far pertain to um, the addition of uh, Mr. Moon's amendments that dealt with putting back in uh, trusted adults such as members of clergy and health care providers and both the uh, 10th and 9th grade. The other amendment is Ms. Corbett Sanders uh, dealing with bystander awareness. The other amendment is Ms. Keys Gamara, which we've just passed, and I believe that that is it. Yes, all right. All those in favor of the main motion as amended? Okay, all right. That motion is unanimous with Mr. Wilson, Ms. Schultz, and Ms. Derna Kofax away from the table. Oh. Ms. Darren at Kofax also votes in favor of that. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. All right, a point of privilege. You may have a moment to share your thoughts. Sure, okay, go ahead. Yes, okay, go ahead. I did, I did want to speak to this because I think um, it's important, and I, I did want to just take a moment to thank, um, <clears throat> excuse me, 
the staff and the FLECAC committee for their hard work on these recommendations. Um, sometimes I think it's difficult to understand things when we ourselves have not experienced them or felt them. And historically, many of our changes to the family life education curriculum have been um, formed from this basis. Um, I talk to many students, teens, um, experiencing puberty, young adults who question their own feelings, and have thankfully approached teachers or counselors asking questions, saying they were taught this, but they were feeling and experiencing something else. And as a public school system, I think it's our responsibility to teach and inform, and I think family life education helps our students navigate through some of the most personal things that they are feeling and experiencing. And for some families, they are appreciative of having the schools provide this information, and for others, they would rather teach these things themselves and they have the, the ability to opt out of any and all FLE lessons. So this past year, our Family Life Curriculum Advisory Committee reviewed the entire FLE program, and, um, when, and they, they appreciate their time and attention to the work, and um, I just want to thank them. I believe it's our school system's job to teach and prepare, and we want all of our students to be treated with dignity and respect and to make them feel included. And while we teach our children when, and our students when they are in their teens, we are educating them for a lifetime. And that's why I appreciate the changes and I appreciate all the support. And thanks for letting me speak on it. Okay. Mr. McElveen, I'm sorry, I believe that you would like also to speak on this larger Just, just very briefly, um, and some of us were surprised we voted on it so quickly. Um, not that that's a bad thing, but um, a lot has been said at this dais tonight um, that I would view as is, is somewhat disparaging of um, the, the Flea Cat Committee, um, and I do want to push back on that. Uh, we have um, a lot of hardworking and dedicated members of our community who serve on that committee, and lots of them have um, great, great experience in the healthcare field. I know my, my appointee is a registered nurse, and so um, when people come out and say that it's, um, that it's not working or that they're um, that, that appointees don't represent the community, uh, I, I do not agree with that. Uh, and I do want to also thank um, Liz Payne for all the time you put into this effort. Um, you know, in, in Fairfax County Public Schools, we have very hardworking and dedicated staff as well. And um, this year I know was particularly trying for this committee, but we are grateful to you and again to all the members of the community and to everyone who spoke here tonight. There is some very powerful testimony. Um, and um, I do want to say just a point of personal privilege. I love you, Kat. Um, and I um, thank you for your, um, your testimony tonight. Thank you. The next item is student rights and responsibilities. And I will call on um, Ms. Corbett Sanders for a motion. This is for Elizabeth, I'm sorry, you were. Okay, I, I, I would like for us to go on, people who are away from the table. This is item 4.03, uh, student rights and responsibilities. I will call on Ms. Corbett Sanders. I move that the school board adopt regulation 2601.32P, student rights and responsibilities, as detailed in the agenda item. Is there a second? A seconded by Ms. Himes. Uh, Ms. Corbett Sanders, would you like to speak to it? And I know there will be an amendment to this as well. Yes, thank you, Chairman Strauss. I'm pleased to move the SRNR for the adoption with the, ex with the expectation that there will be one amendment on dress code. This year's students' rights and responsibilities has been updated in three specific areas, a section on social media, vaping and jeweling, and absenteeism in light of the changes in the federal and state legislation. These sections reflect the impact that these issues have on students' safety and, ability, and their ability to succeed in the classroom. Students will be encouraged to practice good digital citizenship and understand that they need to respect the rights of others and refrain from using profanity and harmful messaging on social media. Additionally, students and parents will be educated on the risk associated with vaping and jeweling. 
Uh, the SRNR provides resources for parents to aid them in navigating the discipline st system within Fairfax County Public Schools. These resources include a flow chart, chart which will be included in the printed document and more importantly the establishment of a family and student ombudsman who will be responsible for aiding parents and students dealing with issues in our schools. The ombudsman will be accessible via email as well as a click from the website. We are honored that Mr. Armando Perry has accepted this role in the organization. And so I look forward to having this adopted. Ms. Hines, did you wish to speak to your second? Not at this time, thank you. Okay, then I will call on Mr. McElveen for an amendment. I move to amend the main motion by revising chapter one, rights and responsibilities of students, item C, dress code as follows. All students are expected to dress appropriately for a K-12 educational environment. Any clothing that interferes or disrupts the educational environment is unacceptable. Clothing with language or images that are vulgar, discriminatory, or obscene, or clothing that promotes illegal or violent conduct, such as gang symbols, the unlawful use of weapons, drugs, alcohol, tobacco, or drug paraphernalia, or clothing that contains threats is prohibited. Uh, clothing should fit, be neat and clean, and conform to standards of safety, good taste, and decency. Clothing that exposes private areas or an excessive amount of bare skin is prohibited. Example of prohibited clothing include, but not, are not limited to, sagging or low-cut pants, tube or halter tops, studded or chain belts, clothing constructed of see-through materials, and head coverings unless, otherwise requ unless required for religious or medical purposes. A principal may provide additional examples to his or her school community. Discussion about dress code violations shall be held privately and maintain the dignity of the student. Parents of students requiring accommodation for religious beliefs, disabilities, or other good causes should contact the principal. Students not complying with this code will be asked to cover the non-complying clothing, change clothes, or go home. Repeated infractions will result in disciplinary action. The current version of Regulation 2613 provides additional details. Uh, Ms. McLaughlin? You need a second. I'm going to second. Oh, oh. I, there was a second. No? Oh, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. It is seconded second, by second. Second. Ms. Evans. I'm sorry. Okay, that's fine. All right. Uh, Ms. Evans, would you like to speak to your second? Do I speak? I, I, I speak, right? Yes, you can speak first. Sorry. <laughs> thank thank late. you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. <laughs> Most people would be shocked to learn that the majority of concerns that I receive from students focus on one issue. It's not student stress, not mental health, not over-testing, not school food, but instead our dress code. As these concerns have come to me in increasing numbers over the years, they have unsurprisingly come disproportionately from one demographic, our female students. Until I began receiving these letters and messages from students, I didn't fully grasp the problematic nature of our dress code. I imagine that many members of our community have also been surprised to learn what's in it. In its unedited form, the vast majority of banned items explicitly target women, just like so many other dress codes around the country. It references cleavage, midriffs, low-cut ne necklines that show cleavage, to tube tops, halter tops, backless blouses, and, or blouses with only ties in the back. Tonight, this board will correct the multi-generational mistake that has allowed this inherently sexist dress code to be perpetuated. We will call for an end to the explicit targeting, objectifying, and shaming of girls. And let me be clear, this is not a Fairfax County problem alone. The issue expands far beyond our schools. We are amidst a national dialogue about respecting women, and our nation is on the verge of ratifying the Equal Rights Amendment. It is long past time that these institutional inequities be addressed not just in Fairfax, but everywhere. Clothing is one of the most personal things to each of us. While for some it can serve simply a utilitarian form, as a util utilitarian form of covering for the body, but for most of us it is also a form of self-expression. How institutions judge one's clothing has a strong effect on an individual's self-image and self-worth. How schools judge students' clothing can have an immeasurable impact on students' dress, mental health, and feelings of acceptance at a critical formative time in their lives. While I cannot speak to dress code infractions from personal experience, after all, I never had to worry about the length of my shorts or the width of my dress straps, I can use some of my time tonight to share some of the countless horror stories that have been sent to me by students over the years to give each of them a voice. One graduate wrote to me, 
In 2005, I was nine. I carefully picked out my picture day dress at my favorite store. It was the most beautiful dress I had seen. I went to school feeling confident and happy, and like I was the prettiest girl in school, only to have one of my teachers quickly shame me for my dress in front of my classmates. She, I was instantly crushed, and I lost my confidence. The entire day I was forced to wear my jacket, and she threatened to not even let me take it off for my picture. I'm now 22, and it's one of the few things I remember from elementary school. One student wrote, my seventh grade math teacher made me stand up in front of the entire class, called me Miss Shorty Shorts, and then he said, my running shorts did not go down to my fingertips, so they weren't appropriate. Another student wrote, in sixth grade, my principal told me my shorts didn't reach my unproportional arms. I had to call my mom in tears and tell her to bring me pants because my shorts were too short. I felt so embarrassed and upset because I had to miss all of art class waiting for my mom to come. Another wrote, I got dress coded so much in middle school that I was actually scared to wear shorts. I had to go to the office and miss class because I was, quote, distracting boys from education, unquote. I guess my education didn't matter as much as the length of my shorts. And another wrote, for my junior year homecoming, I got to the dance, and a staff member asked me in front of all of my friends where the rest of my dress was. The dress I wore was knee length, and my mom approved. I was so embarrassed. And yet another wrote, our school resource officer directed another student to get that, go get that student right there. When the one student brought over the other student, the resource officer proceeded to ask in front of all of us, where is the rest of your shirt? Did you leave it at home? The young lady was embarrassed and disrespected in front of her peers. These are only a handful of stories, and there are probably thousands more out there like them. To protect future generations of girls from these situations, tonight I'm bringing forward a proposal to address the issues they have raised. My proposal has two parts. First, reduce the gendered aspects of our dress code, and second, add a provision to maintain student privacy and dignity in dress code conversations. I will be the first to admit that the language in this proposal is not perfect. Our dress code certainly never has been perfect, and it likely never will be. But this pushes our system in the right direction. Like so many things that we do, it requires doing what's best for students and also ensuring that school staff have objective standards to work from. We will never be able to list every specific example, and if we did, it would result in a return to targeting girls. It is impossible to anticipate every situation, and there will always be some sort of subjectivity. As a result, the most critical part of changing our dress code will be the training that accompanies it to ensure that our school administrators and staff respect the privacy and dignity of all of our students. Our staff is committed to embarking on that training in advance of the coming school year. Moving forward as a system, we must do all we can to change the culture where it's accepted to publicly call out and shame girls for what they wear. I am extremely grateful to Assistant Superintendent Teresa Johnson and Marianne Panarelli for their immense help in crafting this proposal and for working with our principals and legal counsel to come up with language that would be acceptable to as many stakeholders as possible. I'm hopeful that our efforts here tonight will be heard far beyond these walls and serve as encouragement to other school districts around the country to follow our path. I hope Fairfax will be a catalyst for a nationwide conversation about the importance of ending body shaming and maintaining the dignity of students. To all the girls who have been targeted and publicly shamed as a result of our dress code, whatever we do tonight will not make up for what you experienced. I want to publicly and sincerely apologize to you. I want you to know that I am so sorry it has taken us so long to make this important change. Please know that the experiences you have shared have helped inform us, and I'm so proud of you for pushing tirelessly for this important change. And to our current and future generations of students, I want you to know that, should this amendment pass tonight, the school board and the school system will do everything in our power to ensure that you are given the respect and dignity you deserve and that you are never shamed again. I ask my colleagues to join me in supporting this amendment. Ms. Palchuk? Yes, Ms. Evans. Mrs. Strauss, I think you want me to speak to That's my fine. second. That's fine. Your light wasn't on, but if you would, well, I'll, yes, I That's second. fine. Yes. yes, then you may speak to it. That's fine. I have other lights on. Ms. Evans? Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank Mr. McElveen 
for um, identifying this issue, uh, for listening to the students over the years, and for, uh, for raising this issue to the school board and, and bringing it to us. I'm uh, very happy to second this amendment and to strongly support a gender neutral approach to our dress code and to reduce body shaming. Uh, I think you've identified an, an important issue. Uh, one of the more important parts of this amendment, I feel, is that uh, discussion about dress code violations shall be held privately and maintain the dignity of the student. I, uh, th that is something that, that's uh, quite an important change. I have been watching on Twitter uh, some of the uh, examples that have been brought by female students uh, when they support this amendment. Mr. McElveen, I, uh, I see some of these stories and clearly there's a great deal of emotion connected with, with this and uh, it's, it's very personal. It's very personal to, to these girls so, um, who have been treated uh, far more strictly over the years than the boys and made to feel that somehow uh, they're, they're lesser because of their, their clothing choices. So um, thank you, and um, I, I can strongly support this. Okay, I have Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Palchuk, and Ms. Schultz, just so that I'm reading the lights correctly. Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, can I just get an administrative clarity first, um, the, especially the statement that uh, Ms. Evans just read where it says discussion about dress code violations shall be held privately and maintain the dignity of students. It's underlined. It, it, so that was new language that didn't exist? That's correct. Everything underlined is new. Okay, so then above where it says clothing that exposes and it deletes cleavage and deletes parts and adds in areas. So how did that sentence read before you added in clothing that exposes? Because there's cleavage. There should be a comma after cleavage. Cleavage, comma, private parts, comma. Right, but my point is, if this is where I just wanted some clarity. If it's saying clothing that exposes is underlined as if that's new language. Yeah, that's that's incorrect. That was there before. That was there yeah. before. Okay, so I I just the reason I wanted to understand is I want to give praise where praise should be, but then I'm sorry I got trying to get an understanding of what was original language, what's new language. So um, Ms. Evans picked up on something and, and I want to especially spotlight this and, and thank um, Mr. McElveen. Um, you know, I, I can't even imagine whether it's a, a male student or a female student that if there was an issue about dress code violation that wouldn't be done privately and, and maintaining the dignity of a student. So that to me is probably one of the most essential changes here because um, when you talk about the vulnerability, the psychological and emotional vulnerability of our adolescents um, being called out for your clothing, um, I think it's really important that we, we put that specifically in there as a, an expectation. So I'm, I'm very pleased to see that. I did um, hear from some principals um, that Dr. Brabrand, you probably have heard this, and, and Mr. McElveen, I think you spoke well to this, that subjectivity is a piece of this, and, and so that's going to always make things a bit difficult. Um, so um, terminology like any clothing that interferes with or disrupts the educational environment, um, other words like um, good taste and decency, um, I would just say that I think we will probably need to do some additional um, uh, wordsmithing in this next coming year and, and sort of just a word to the wise, Dr. Brabrand, when staff's working on this, because I think those are, those are words in here that still leave a lot to subjectivity, and, and they're actually adjectives that are pretty loaded with judgment. So um, I, I, again, appreciate what Mr. McElveen's done to bring this to our attention. Um, but I also want to say something else because while I so appreciate the sensitivity of my colleagues' comments here tonight, I want to make sure it's not mischaracterizing this school system and our educators. Um, I don't believe that Fairfax County Schools or our administrators in the building were trying to body shame our students. And that's been mentioned a couple times tonight. 
And I think my colleagues are doing it out of sensitivity and concern for the girls, but I also want to give a counterpoint that the more that gets said at this dais, we're almost assigning that that's what's happened in our buildings as if there was intent. And so I don't think that's what people meant, but I do think we just want to be careful that is not something that the school system stands for. I think that it's sometimes um, we know through Virginia state regulations and Virginia code and certainly Fairfax County regulations, our, our language isn't always as precise and as clear as we'd like it to be. Um, and so for that, I'd like to keep our conversation tonight very much in a positive statement, which is thank you, Mr. McElveen, for helping us to improve the way in which we communicate out to our students and families and our administrators about expectations. And um, as someone who grew up in a family of three girls, it's obviously um, something I can deeply appreciate about wanting to make sure that both our male students and being the mother of three boys now, I know it's as important that our boys um, feel respected and that they are treated with dignity. And we want that for our girls and our boys in our schools. Thank you. Ms. Palchuk. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. McElveen, um, and Ms. Evans, and uh, Ms. McLaughlin. I think you took some of my words. Uh, I actually had shared information with Dr. Brabrand after attending a Women's Law Center uh, workshop at NSBA, NSBA at our annual conference, um, and they did share quite a bit of this. So I agree with you, Mr. McElveen, that baby steps, and this is an important first step, um, but as Ms. McLaughlin pointed out, we still do have quite a bit of subjective language in there um, that I hope we can work together to address moving forward. Uh, and also, um, the way that discipline occurs around these infractions. Uh, I do think it's important that these conversations be held privately, so I appreciate you including that. Um, and then finally, obviously we know in a system as large as ours, um, the most effective way is to look at the way we train, educate, and communicate this information to our almost 200 sites. So I know uh, we do a, a good job of sharing updates with all of our students and ensuring that they are checked off. I do hope um, we have a plan to make sure this is communicated, trained, shared with staff. I know it will be a shift and a change, and I think that's where we, we need to figure out how we best support our schools, our administrators, and our educators, um, and also our, our teachers and families to know how to advocate um, when the changes do not happen. So I will be supporting this, and I do hope um, for next year that we can take some feedback of how this is working in our schools and, and look at additional changes, especially as the report shows um, when we are seeing a lot of this targeting uh, girls of color uh, for, for some of their, their behavior as well as their dress code. Thank you. And Ms. Schultz, I'm sorry that I did not, you did not get to make your final remarks on FLECAC. After we dispose of this discussion motion, I will come back to you because I believe you had more that you wish to say in the FLECAC motion. Yeah, I'm was very sorry you were away from the table. Unceremoniously cut off. Yes, um, I'm sorry. So I so, will come back to you. Um, I, you know, I, I struggle because we just spent all of this time talking about, you know, um, making things gender neutral, but this is targeted at girls. So is it gender neutral or are we acknowledging that boys and girls are different? Um, girls have cleavage, boys don't. And I, I gotta tell you, um, a story from 13 years ago, um, while it's poignant, that to me points to a professional development piece that has to do with how our administrators are trained to talk and work with kids. And I go to, again, you know, a Principal Morris type of graduation speech where it is clear I mean, it's crystal clear with every word he delivered how, how much he cares for his students, regardless of their struggles, regardless of their backgrounds, regardless of um, uh, how they arrive in his school. And it's clear to me his staff does too. So the, 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 when, when I hear you know, a, a particular, you know, an anecdotal story of a particular staff member talked poorly to a child about what they were wearing, then that's a professional development piece for that teacher, that administrator, that SRO. Um, you don't change 
your language and your, and your dress code to prevent the opportunity of us potentially shaming a girl through words in our dress code that talk about her body parts that we want to have covered. And, and I, I give you a relevant example that happened today. Today, I walked into a high school and um, I, I, I arrived at the school as a young lady was being dropped off by what looked like her father um, wearing nothing other than what I could describe as Daisy Duke shorts, um, a, an adorable sh shirt that if you want to be at a beach or something is perfectly appropriate, but the shirt came down to here and it came up to here and her belly wasn't covered and she was walking into school. And I, I have to tell you, boys are visual beings and it is not fair to have a young lady um, walking the schools of a high school dressed with, you know, shorts up to here, tops down to there, and tops up to here. And I, I and when do we, what, what is, you know, uh, too, an expan too much of an expanse of skin to show? You know, it, are there rulers? I mean, the, the nebulous nature of you can't show too much skin. Well, what is too much? And then is an administrator going to get in trouble for one type of clothing, um, cover up your, you know, cleavage down to there is a pretty, that's a pretty clear, like, you can understand that. Um, and it doesn't have to be a tube top or a halter top or something backless to be cut down way too far um, to be not appropriate for an educational setting. And I'm, I'm sorry to say that there are times where girls are making inappropriate choices for an educational environment. There are some times that there are boys, but it's just not as often. So disproportionately, it's going to be, it's going to be winding up young ladies needing to have a discussion about what's, what's appropriate. If they're wearing a, sh a skirt that's extraordinarily short, I, that's not something that a boy was going to be wearing that's going to cause him trouble. It's a different situation. And if, if our administrators, for some reason, are not having appropriate conversations with young people, and that would include publicly, you don't need to call a child out publicly. You can say, hey, you know, can I talk to you for a second? And they can be you know, taken aside, and that can be a learning moment. But I'm very concerned with where we're headed that we're, we're, calling we're calling out individual stories. I haven't had it, I mean, I understand that y you said that you worked with Ms. Johnson, but I mean, I haven't had the principals weigh in on this. I haven't had teachers weigh in on this. Are we now gonna saddle the teachers and administrators and principals in our buildings with a new nuance of what it means to be appropriately dressed? You know, we, we seem to be fighting a tide here of either it's me too and we're trying to prevent sexual harassment and we know that that is a, a, a strengthening of our language and our professional development that we need to do across the board in our athletic communities, in our teaching community, in our administrative community, um, and, and be a leader in that regard, but then we can't in the same breath say, um, oh, by the way, you know, you have to cover your private parts. Well, you can cover your private parts with a bikini. I mean, so um, that's not appropriate for an educational setting either. So I, I think this muddies the water further. And I, I, I think that if we want to have this kind of conversation, it needs to be tied in with more professional development um, uh, by um, the system for the people running our schools, and we need to have a more comprehensive conversation. I'd like to meet with the, particularly the high school uh, uh, principals and have a conversation with them about what they encounter and what their concerns are, because actually what I hear from them is they, they're happy enforcing the, the dress policy because it makes things easier at school when, when people understand what the lanes are. And I think this muddies the water a lot. Um, Ms. Darren at Kofax. So I agree with a little bit of what everybody has set up here. Um, I did talk to Mr. McElveen about this. I, I, I thank him for bringing this, this out. Um, but I don't think this is our best work and I don't think this is the best way to govern. Um, I think um, 
there, Ms. McLaughlin, as much as I would like to uh, stay positive, I have my own set of, from having a girl and having her cadre of friends, a lot of body shaming comments that have happened. And Dr. Braybrand, I definitely think there is room for professional development amongst staff members. Um, there have often been times where I have heard stories, many antidotal stories, about girls being publicly called out in cafeterias, in places, by, by administrators, teachers. Um, it is not um, that it, those are anecdotal. Mr. McElwain said he had hundreds of them, and um, I could probably add a whole bunch too. So, you know, I will support this as a first step. I definitely wish this could have come to us earlier, that we could have had the opportunity to uh, have it at the work session, um, because maybe you can tell by my tone, it's something that I that I have found. Um, and, and, it, and it is administered very, very differently by different principals, by different people who, who choose certain, they choose to call it certain bits of clothing and not others. Um, you know, I know one principal where leggings were not allowed in that classroom. And if you don't know what leggings are, they're those kind of mostly black pants that are kind of, you know, close to the skin and everybody wears them. And, but there was one school that you weren't allowed to wear them. Hmm, you know, why? Um, it's, so those kinds of things, I think, if we're changing things and revising things, everybody needs to hear about that and everybody needs to understand that this does happen and we need, we need more conversation around it. And uh, while I will be supporting it, I, I don't think this is the best way to do this kind of work because I think there are, as Mr. McElveen said, there's a lot of emotion around some of these things and a lot of it happens because uh, people were callous in their comments about, about fashion that girls, mostly girls, have been wearing. Uh, Ms. Keys Kamara. I will be supporting this motion, and I, I do so primarily because I understand that words matter. Uh, Mr. McElveen, I still remember some things that were said to me when I was a teenager, and I'm pretty sure I'm older than those people you just quoted. Um, and, and, I, and I think this is a step in the right direction. Do we need to do more work? Absolutely. I would love to hear uh, from a, a broader base how our staff members can would like to address this and how they, you know, you know, how they think they can improve. I think that's a great way to start. But I also think that this is a good uh, way to begin those discussions. We can signal a change by the policies that we support. And so that would be the reason that I was, would, would suggest this. Um, and, I, and I hear Ms. Schultz with respect to language. Can we truly have gender neutral language? I, I, that's a debate that would keep me here longer than I want to stay. But it does say, it does say halter tops. I don't think gentlemen wear those. Um, and it says excessive bare skin, which I think is an attempt to try to be more fair. So, you know, I, I think that this is a, you know, we're going in the right direction. We do need to talk about it more. We probably need professional development. Um, and I, and more than anything, I, you know, I'm sure our, our staff members understand um, that that words can really stick, but perhaps we, we need to focus a bit more on that and, and we can grow in that area as well. So I will support it. Thank you. Ms. Fetakanda, you don't have to get up and go to school in the morning. Everybody has to yeah, tomorrow's that. actually my sister's last day, but I was at last Tuesday. So I do, I support this amendment because I know that this is not everything, but it's something in the right direction. So we're being more fair by making sure that the language is, I guess, slightly more neutral, although it can't be complete. It, it's not yet going to be completely neutral. But I also think that this gives us an opportunity to just like take student input into what kind of clothing is appropriate and what isn't, so we can standardize across the county. So. I think most of us would agree that leggings are generally appropriate items of clothing, but if we're having like one school where students aren't able to wear those, then we can we we need to be working with our students to see what clothing they find is appropriate, what we would what you guys would find appropriate, and then attempt to find a middle ground so that students aren't being unfairly penalized by this dress code. Right. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Corbett Sanders. 
Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. McElveen, for bringing this to our attention. As you know, this was part of the conversation at the work session when we talked about the SRNR. We did talk about um, the differences in the latitude that are given to principals at individual um, sites across the county. And at that time, um, many of us expressed some concerns that there was not a commonality in um, approach across the county. And so um, I think this is a good first step. And as the mother of only daughters, I really welcome this because I have very different daughters, and what I have found is that words matter more for one than the other, and that when you, um, you know, just a comment about clothing made to one has a different effect than if the same comment were made to another, and so this sends a very positive message about the appropriateness of um, really uh, focusing on uh, one type of clothing worn by girls versus, you know, some people take great offense of seeing a lot of bare skin on a boy too. And so this is really a, it begins to rebalance our language and I think that's good. And hopefully next year we'll, look at it again and maybe make further refinements. Along those lines, I do also think that it will be important for professional development, um, for staff at the individual schools, but also talking to parents about what, you know, what we expect as far as appropriate attire for kids coming to school ready to learn. Ms. Hines? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think the point that Mr. McElveen's trying to make here, and I think he's making it well, is that the current language is not gender neutral. It's far from gender neutral, and that's why we need to begin to make these changes. Um, and I feel like if we accomplish nothing else tonight, we will have um, exposed the whole conversation, at least a little bit, about boys' responsibility, these sort of old-fashioned notions that um, boys, that girls are responsible for whether boys can focus. Um, I, I just don't get that at all. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I so I, I hope that we continue to talk about that. I, you know, teachers make mistakes and I'm a teacher and, you know, sometimes we, we make assumptions and we don't realize we're making them. And if the policy doesn't help us do a better job, then we need to change the policy. So thank you, Mr. McElveen. Okay, I will call for the vote on Mr. McElveen's amendment to the SRNR. All those in favor of the amendment? Okay, that is Evans, McLaughlin, Palchek, McElveen, Corbett Sanders, Strauss, Moon, Hines, uh, Darren Kofex, Keys Kamara. Uh, opposed? Abstention? Ms. Schultz. Okay, then we are back to the main motion, which is the SRNR. Is there any other discussion on the uh, overall motion on the uh, SRNR? Ms. McLaughlin? Yes, um, I, I just wanted to um, take a moment and say that uh, this board has had a lot of conversation about how we continuously improve in our student discipline practices. And uh, one of the things that the board just spoke to a few weeks ago when we were voting on our budget was uh, saying how important it was that um, as we look at the needs within our hearings office, we also look at what our data is telling us about uh, student discipline and disproportionality. And because we ended up passing um, that information as part of uh, a budget amendment and um, direction to the superintendent, we didn't actually need to then do it here tonight, but I didn't want it to go unspoken and reinforced um, that the disproportionality we have for our students of color, as well as our students with disabilities, is uh, something that I greatly appreciate the mindfulness of this board as a whole. Every single one of the 12 of us has spoken to our commitment and our desire, and um, Superintendent Braybrand, you come with a great record of work 
um, in your former superintendency at City of Lynchburg. And so I appreciate that um, I look forward to this next year as you continue to uh, wrap your arms around all the uh, continuous areas of improvement that we want to do, that, that this is going to be another one of those. And that data helps inform our decision making. And so that's going to be a really important piece. Um, but I do want to just also highlight for my colleagues that I continue to receive anecdotal information about how great we are doing as a county in our juvenile and domestic relations court that our students who get referred for something that happens either in our schools or in our community, they go over to the juvenile court and they are very often given this opportunity through restorative justice to do diversion, so they're not court involved. And yet, it's not necessarily the mindset that I've seen happen here on our side. And in fact, I'm familiar with one recent case where the family literally reached out to me and said, when I dealt with the, the juvenile court and the intake officer, I was treated with kindness and respect. When I was asking questions and trying to understand what's happening at the hearings office level, it was a very fearful exchange. Again, that's anecdotal, but this isn't something that's new to what I've heard. And so I do hope that for all of us in the school division, we understand that when a student is referred to the hearings office for what can be an ex expulsion related offense, that we never lose sight of the fact that especially when these are um, first offenders and they're nonviolent offenses and these are young kids who are trying to find their way and, and, and have made a, typically a juvenile um, ill thought mistake that we don't lose sight of the fact that we need families to feel as if this is still a caring culture, even when they find themselves um, dealing with a discipline infraction and, and, the, and or the hearings office. And this isn't just to the hearings office too, it's even when we're in our school buildings. So as we can move toward restorative justice um, in an even deeper level, and I'm proud of the work that this board has done in the six and a half years I've been on here, that, that is something that, again, each of us has, has shown um, a, a deeper appreciation for, but we're not there. And this SRNR doesn't have us exactly where we need to be. Um, and Dr. Braber and I actually did kind of uh, give you uh, a light pass this year because some of my colleagues know I, I tend to like to dissect the SRNR and push a little harder, but. Uh, I figured you had enough on your plate this year, and, and I look forward to collaborating with you and staff and how we can continue to, to really do our best work and that we mirror what we're seeing over with um, the juvenile court um, here in Fairfax County. I mean, that's, that's really what it's all about. So thank you. Okay, I will call for the vote on the SRNR as amended. As amended. All those in favor? That is Evans, uh, McLaughlin, Palchik, McElveen, Corbett Sanders, Strauss, Moon, Hines, Jarenak Kofax, Keys Gamara. Opposed? Abstention? Ms. Schultz. Okay, Ms. Schultz, I'll come back. I'm sorry, um, you were away from the table when we made, did the final vote on Fleet Pack, and I understand uh, you had more that you wished to say. So, yes. just, I'm yeah, sorry. And I'm sorry, we have one bathroom back there. and. Mr. Okay. Nett, Kofax, you get another it. chance. <laughs> so I, 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 uh, I apologize. Um, uh, look, we're um, we're making policy at this table and deciding which populations are important and when they're and when they're important. And clearly, I would not have voted um, uh, for uh, what, what uh, transpired earlier this evening because yet again, we've gone rogue. Um, we even decided this time to do parental engagement and ask the f community what they thought of the recommendations before we vote on them. And they told us somewhere between eight to one to uh, 100 to zero that they did not want us to do what we did tonight. And it is unfortunate that it is necessary to demure 
on who is important based on what vote we want to get to. And, and I find uh, we get ourselves in trouble as a board when um, we navigate down paths that don't include authentic engagement with the public. And if you really want to make a change and you really think that we know better than the public, then I think you have to dipstick and go out and ask the public first. And um, in a difficult time of the year, um, we had more responses than we've had in years by factors of thousands of percent. And the community clearly was trying to tell us something. If we don't care what parents are going to say on a survey, then why ask them? If we don't care what youth are going to say on a youth survey, then why ask them? But we hold up the youth survey as, you know, the tantamount way forward in deciding what's best for kids. There isn't a parent community survey. This was the closest thing to it, and they told us in spades not to do what we did. We've gotten in trouble with that in the past. We have colleagues that have gotten themselves in trouble with it in the past. And our best work is done when we work together, when we talk together, when we have the time to authentically talk together, when we have time to ask questions of staff, when not one committee is treated differently than all the other committee, committees and their votes are suppressed or held in secret. It is nothing to do with the members who are already there, but there are not parents represented on the FLECAC committee. And if there aren't parents represented on the FLECAC committee in spades, as the state standards require, if there's one or two or three parents, then that's not representing parents. If there's a teacher who happens to be a parent, that, they're, they're appointed as a teacher. There are 10 teachers on, on the committee. There's four students. There's a handful, a, a tiny infinitesimal handful that are there as parents. And we're not, when we have a committee that doesn't intentionally represent parents, which is called for in the state standard, um, when we don't intentionally go and seek public engagement before the recommendations are made, we don't intentionally look to what our public wants us to do, and then even if we do do it in a survey and they send in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, you know, Mr. McElveen uh, uh, highlighted hundreds of anecdotes that he has on the dress code, and those became important enough to change the dress code, but not the thousand parents who told us not to do it. So we, we, we have our priorities at, 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 at odds with what we should be doing to represent the public when we seek to engage and we ignore the engagement, or we seek to decide who we engage and when we engage, or we seek to decide who to put on a committee, but then the committee can vote in secret, or half of them don't even have to vote at all, and they don't have to tell us who voted and how they voted. That's not transparency, and that's not our best work, and that's why I think that we, we failed at what we did tonight. Okay, our consent agenda is the next Item, our adopted rules of parliamentary procedure, Robert's rules, provide for a consent agenda listing several items for approval of the board by a single motion. Many items listed have gone through board review and documentation have, has been provided to all board members and the public in advance. Items may be removed from the consent agenda at the request of any board member prior to the meeting. 5.01, approve the minutes of May 10th, regular meeting minutes. 5.02, award a contract for the South Lakes High School softball field lighting project to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, R.E. Lee Electric Company, Inc., in the amount of $273,945, and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute, deliver, and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 5.03, award a contract for the Sandberg Middle School softball field lighting project to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, Dalton Electric Company, Inc., in the amount of $266,044, and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute, deliver, and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 5.04, Award the contracts for the hazardous material removal to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, 
Goal Services, Inc. primary and Waco, Inc. secondary and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute and administer such contracts on behalf of the school board. Is there any objection to approving the consent agenda? Hearing and seeing no objection, the consent agenda is approved. Next is new business, and I call on Dr. Braybrand for an introduction, very brief introduction of the goal two presentation. Brief introduction, brief presentation, followed by work session after this brief presentation. We have uh, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Ramey, Dr. Waltz all uh, coming up to share about Goal 2, our caring culture. And I know you all worked so hard on this, and we have three of you doing <laughs> this. We're sorry it's so late. That concludes our presentation from <laughs> Dr. Johnson. <laughs>
over the past year, what we're doing around uh, leaves. We know it's been a hot topic for our employee associations. We continue to work with them as we move through this. But uh, we wanted to give you a glimpse of where we were this evening. We know it's been a long night and part of wellness is a good night's sleep. So with that, we will uh, close up and we look forward to uh, speaking more with you on Monday. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moon. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Ryan McElveen and I are the meeting managers for the work session on Monday. Uh, because of the graduations that we had to attend, uh, we were not able to meet with the staff members to prepare for the Monday work session until this afternoon. And at that time, we discussed that, that uh, with two hours allocated for this portion of the work session, this topic, that rather than spending a lot of time in doing the presentation, uh, I know that we, are, we may be somewhat tired this week, and on Sunday, Sunday is Father's Day, so we may have some, some events, family events scheduled. However, I still wanna urge you all to read ahead everything that is on the board doc, not just on this topic, but there are two other, two other topics as well. Do your homework so that we could minimize the time needed for a presentation, but do more of Q&A and, and discussion and having a dialogue amongst ourselves. So if you have, you know, if you, if you are going home tonight and just cannot fall asleep, start reading, <laughs> start reading and send in all your questions, if not by tomorrow, at least by Sunday, at least by Sunday, so send in all your questions that you may have. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much. We will look forward to uh, a robust discussion on this report on Monday. No. Huh. Don't miss McLaughlin. No, no, staff can walk back because I'm making a comment here. Oh, all right. Um, it's late. No, I, I Ms. Strauss. Oh, no, I'm just talking to them. They can That's call. why I said they didn't have to stay there. Um, I'm just going to make my plea in public again. Staff works extremely hard on these reports. They're extremely dense, and they're a primary part of our governing work. And I'm gonna just make my plea that as we go into this work session on Monday, can everyone be mindful of how well we're actually able to do some substantive discussion with each other about this substantive report and information, and whether we need to finally start trying to look at a better you know, a, a designation of the work, because I just, I feel like we constantly rush through some of the most important things we're supposed to be reviewing and discussing with each other and with the superintendent. And I, I'm just already preparing for what's gonna happen on Monday. And so keep, everybody keep an open mind and, and let's not give short shrift to this work. And even if it means that we'll have to look at maybe revisiting some of the stuff in the goal to report to just give it its due uh, attention that it deserves. Okay, Madam Chair, that's one of the reasons why I'm asking my colleagues to do all the reading prior to coming to our session. I, I agree, Mr. Moon, but this isn't a problem with reading. As you know, with 12 voices and a dense report, it's the ability actually even to dialogue with each other on it. Okay, thank you. We have our homework to do. Uh, the following are new business agenda items. There will not be a vote tonight on these items, but action is scheduled at a future meeting. 6.01, approve the strategic plan goal two, caring culture report is detailed in the agenda item. 6.02, approve and award a contract to the University of Virginia for the provision of the accelerated certification cohort educational program effective May 1, 2018 through June 30, 2023 and authorize the division superintendent or deputy superintendent to execute and administer such contract on behalf of the school board, 6.03. Appoint individuals to serve for a one-year term ending June 30, 2019 on the adult and community education, advanced academic programs, career and technical education, human resources, minority student achievement oversight, school health, and students with disabilities advisory committee as listed in the agenda item. 6.04, approve the governance committee recommendations for revisions to the, to the strategic governance manual regarding advocacy letters and the minority student advisory oversight committee. 6.05, approve the appointment of Lee Burton, R. Chase Ramey, and Marty Smith to the ERFC Board of Trustees for a one-year term beginning July 1st, 2018 and ending June 30th, 2019. 
6.06, approve the appointment of Michael Burke to the ERFC Board of Trustees for a one-year term beginning July 1, 2018. 6.07, adopt the 2019-2020 standard school year calendar as detailed in the agenda item. The board will discuss the school year calendar at the June 18th work session. Superintendent Matters, Dr. Braybrand. Thank you, Chairman Strauss. It's been a great end of the year with so many celebrations. Uh, as a former high school principal, graduation still just uh, is such an impact to go to those. I got to go to many, but not all of them, but it was wonderful to see so many of our graduates, families, and school staff and get to congratulate them. I got to speak at a couple of them, and uh, I really wish all of our 2018 graduates the best of luck, and I know um, I hope, I recognize many may leave for a while, but I hope many will return and come back to our community and many will join the FCPS family. Speaking of the FCPS family, last week we were honored to really recognize the very best of our workforce. I want to uh, congratulate uh, Dr. Ramey and the entire HR team for the FCPS honors event held over at George Mason. It was a wonderful event. We really expanded, you know, leaving and coming back. We have expanded in a, in a, in a major way the, the number of people that we're honoring in the school system for outstanding work. And we honor teachers, school-based administrators, non-school-based administrators. I was just awed, and it was one of those moments in this first year coming back that only in Fairfax County. Um, one of my mentors, who was a su retired superintendent from downstate who was there, wrote me an email uh, the following day and said, I've never seen anything like this in my life. And it is a major impact on culture. So really neat. Then on last Sunday, I got to go to Cappy, something that I observed as a teacher, a principal, an assistant superintendent, and now as superintendent. And again, I want to thank Chairman Strauss. I want to thank uh, Judy Bounds. I want to thank Bill Strauss and the legacy he created. This is another event founded in Fairfax that only happens here in this country and uh, the kids here got an experience at the Kennedy Center that no one else gets really around the country or maybe even the world. Today I got to go to the Fairfax County Retired Educators Luncheon and I ran into my cooperating teacher from 25 years ago, Nancy Feakin. Um, she's in her 80s now, excited to be out and about and excited to reconnect with uh, that young cooperating teacher intern that she uh, helped along 25 years ago. It was wonderful to see too, they honored seven of our students with $2,000 scholarships. All of them are planning on studying education and I already, because Bud Spillane did this for me, I guaranteed all of them a job upon successful completion, Mr. Moon, of their college, uh, uh, their college experience, and uh, I want to thank FCRE for that, and thank you too to Apple Federal Credit Union. They gave 29 of our kids this year $5,000 scholarships to attend colleges of their choice. So what an amazing, amazing sponsor. And we have so many businesses and folks, um, just like earlier tonight, that recognize and sponsor our kids, but this was um, special too that I wanted to bring up. Um, I'm leaving with my boys to go to an amusement park in another state over this weekend for Father's Day and for their birthday. I hope all of you have a wonderful uh, weekend and get a chance to reconnect with your fathers or remember your fathers and uh, be with family. But it's been a great school year. I've been honored to be your superintendent this year. I have grows to get better at and in your first year you learn some things that you can do better the next time around and I look forward to continuing to work with you on the work of making this the premier school system in the country. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bray Brown, and happy Father's Day. Uh, now we have some committee reports. Um, Ms. Hines for Audit Committee. Sure, thank you. The Audit Committee met on May 29th for our May monthly meeting. We had a staffing update. We had uh, an update on the status of our FY18 internal audit engagements, and we are on track to finish those within fiscal year 18. We also received a report on the FY18 workers' compensation audit. And we began to discuss the FY19 uh, audit plan. We looked at the risk assessment and audit plan draft that the school board will vote on 
next month, I believe, is in July. We'll vote on that. So uh, the next audit committee meeting is June 27th. Ms. Schultz, um, CPDC. Just super briefly, we met on Monday, um, May 4th. Um, for CPDC, we asked, we're going to be asking in chairs for space on the July work session to bring forward a recommendation to the board. And we had to extend one more time the um, applications for FPAC. And we have an upcoming closed session to review those applications and bring forward recommendations to the board for new members for FPAC for uh, the success of calendar year. Board matters, start with Ms. Evans. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to start with a shout out to the Stewart High School boys soccer team. Um, they were the district tournament champions for the first time in 26 years and the regional champions for the first time in 27 years. So they went to states um, and um, did, did very, very well in a very close game in the semifinals. So congratulations uh, to them. Um, they did lose uh, ultimately to number one Oakton, but that's all right. You know, congratulations to Oakton too. The, uh, they all did very, very well. Um, I want to thank everyone who came out to the town hall meeting and um, student panel that Delegate Kay Corey and I held um, recently with um, on gun violence, and I want to thank uh, Ms. Vaticonda for being one of our student panelists, as well as student leaders from Falls Church High School, Stewart, and uh, from Prince William County as well. There was a, a wonderful conversation and um, excellent comments from from uh, members of the community as well, and we, we did get a good turnout and uh, a lot of uh, thoughtful comments and, uh, and questions as well. I also want to congratulate Mrs. Strauss on yet again an, another wonderful Cappy's event. That's always one of the highlights of, of the year to see our very, very talented theater students as well as journalism students with the, the, uh, the Critics Award uh, showcased uh, at the Kennedy Center. So um, it, it, it's just a magnificent event. So. Thank you for uh, continuing to um, to showcase our students that way. And uh, besides that, I uh, was was uh, very very pleased to go to the graduations um, over the last couple of weeks and celebrate with the students. I even got to speak at one. And um, I uh, want to uh, last last but not least uh, congratulate and thank all of the fathers out there. Ms. McLaughlin. Uh, first, I just wanted to share that uh, both uh, Ms. Schultz and I and Ms. Keith Gamara had an amazing experience um, th this past week right after we did the FCPS honors. We rushed over to Lake Braddock Secondary School where the um, minority parents for excellence in education hosted their annual um, awards night to recognize um, academic achievement of the students. And what I wanted you all to know was the most incredible speaker who was there that night. Her name is L. Denise Wardlaw, class of 91 out of Lake Braddock, went on to UVA, School of Engineering, and then on to Columbia for her MBA. She is a um, just remarkable speaker. She also happened to have been one of our former student representatives to the school board. And just her powerful, powerful lesson to the students as a woman of color and speaking about the different adversities she experienced, including, including losing her mother at the age of 24. And then, you know, going through the challenges as a mother and trying to help her child who was going through health issues. It was just incredible to see these young people just looking at and listening to her so intently because she just connected at such a deep level. And it, it was really one of the best speakers I've heard in such a long time. And it was an honor just to, to be able to spend the evening with her. So that was incredible. And, um, and then uh, at the Robinson graduation, we had a gentleman who graduated class of 75. And he was also just incredibly inspirational. He's a Tony Award winning um, director or Tony nominated director has written for um, some of the best shows on television or directed for them as well and he just also spoke with such inspiration again about 
um, what life will, will bring you. Great humility talked about adversity and chasing his dream and finding out that it wasn't to be an actor, but it was to be a director. And just those messages to our young people to say, when you think you, you know what your path is going to be, sometimes it's not that path but then you actually find your calling. And so um, that was beautiful. Um, on a private note, as my colleagues know, my youngest son graduated from Woodson yesterday, and uh, that officially makes me an FCPS alumni parent. I no longer have any more children um, in the school system, and um, I have to say, after 17 years of being a parent in the system, it's, uh, it was bittersweet. Um, and, you know, Dr. Brabrand, um, we've talked about this. I'm a second generation Fairfax County family through my husband and his brothers. And uh, I don't regret a day that we traded the wine country of my hometown to raise our children here. And while we can con continue to create um, a joyful learning environment, I, I am deeply indebted to um, what my boys have been able to accomplish um, through our great teachers, our caring administrators, and, um, and a school board that so deeply appreciates the, the need for um, finding our ways to better serve our families. And so, and to my colleagues who were there, you guys were awesome. Oh my gosh, everybody was shooting pictures of me giving my diploma to my son and giving him a hug, and, and those pictures are priceless. So, uh, to all of the graduates, um, especially those of you who will do the, the perennial beach week, please parents, please kids, that drive is, can be very treacherous. And we have lost Fairfax County students coming back from beach week because they were tired and, it's a, and being behind the wheel when you're tired is, is um, it, it presents a risk. So please enjoy celebrating your, your incredible graduations, but please, please be safe out there. And uh, we look forward to hearing back from our graduates about their exciting new adventures. And especially to Niharika, you've been a joy. Mr. McAfee. So I do want to um, extend my congratulations to the McLaughlins and the Wilsons for their, <clears throat> their graduates this year. Very exciting. Um, Mr. And Moon and I have completed our annual um, tour, de tour de force uh, through, through the graduations. Um, I think I was able to get to 24 this year. <clears throat> um, and I do have a few awards to, to share. Um, the winner for the shortest ceremony is Langley High School at 83 minutes. Um, the best speaker I heard, what I agree with Ms. McLaughlin, was at Robinson Secondary. Um, he, he was uh, fantastic. Um, the most inspiring student speaker, I do believe, was at Woodson um, when we had the hard of hearing student. Um, and um, that was um, very, very, very moving. Um, and I do also want to congratulate those of us on, <clears throat> or, sorry, those on LT and on the board who gave speeches this year. Um, Terry Dade gave, obviously Superintendent Brabrand gave a couple. Um, Terry Dade gave a great address, as did Douglas Tyson um, at two of our alternative schools. Sandy Evans um, gave a marvelous speech at Falls Church. Um, and I, I will find your husband that, that tape uh, as soon as I can. Um, and <laughs> um, anyway, long story. Um, but congratulations to all our graduates. We hope you have a wonderful summer, and uh, we look forward to seeing you back in the fall. Ms. Corbett Sanders. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, I, too, want to congratulate you, Ms. Schultz, on a, another wonderful Cappy celebration. It was fantastic. And, I mean, Ms. Strauss, oh, God. It is late, isn't it? Um, and, a wonderful evening, and I was thrilled to be able to give the award for the ensemble to the West Potomac uh, students, so that was wonderful. Um, I, too, went to a number of uh, graduations, and one uh, this year even at the Adult Detention Center, where 27 
people were given their GEDs, and that was amazing. And so uh, it's a program that I am so glad that Fairfax County Public Schools supports. It's wonderful. Uh, yesterday, I had the pleasure of being at a convening uh, by UCM and the Washington Regional Area Grant Making Authority. Um, the convening was on becoming one Fairfax, envisioning a uh, racially equitable Fairfax County and had the pleasure of doing that with uh, my colleague, Ms. Steranak Koufax, as well as our colleagues on the Board of Supervisors and um, uh, Mr. Duran and um, the new equity officer for the Board of Supervisors, um, Carla um, Bruce. And so it was just a great discussion on the challenges this county faces in uh, trying to have a one Fairfax. Uh, and I look forward to the next step, which is to have some real solutions coming forward. Um, also looking forward to this Saturday, where there will be a 185 year celebration of Gum Springs. And I know I'll see a few of you there. Uh, encourage the community to go out for it. And on the 25th, there will be a School Safety in the Commonwealth Forum uh, with moderators Brian Moran and uh, County Executive Brian Hill, as well as panelists. Um, and so I would encourage people to participate in that um, forum on the 25th at the Comfort Inn on uh, Lowestdale Road from 1 to 3.30. And I know there will be staff from the county there. Ah, Dr. Duran and Mr. Smith, excellent. We will be well represented. And that's it. Mr. Moon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have not been able to match uh, Mr. McElvin's 24 this year, but, but I have done at least 21, and I think I have spent over the last week or so way too much time with Mr. McElvin. So Mr. McElvin, do not call me this weekend because I don't want to see you until Monday at the full day work session. But in addition to those uh, high school graduations, I. Uh, have been able to attend a elementary schools, couple of elementary schools promotion ceremonies for fifth graders at Braddock Elementary and sixth graders at Montreal Elementary. I, I enjoyed you know, those elementary school ceremonies as much as I did for high schools. Ms. Hines. Yeah, just quickly, uh, <clears throat> congratulations to all the graduates and to all the teachers and other folks who work in the school buildings. Congratulations to you also uh, on the conclusion of another successful school year. Uh, I hope you have a chance to reflect and rest a little bit over the summer. And of course, at every graduation you go to, uh, we make sure that the kids the graduating seniors uh, thank their families, and I think that's really important to do as well. It takes a village, a family, a whole school to get kids to that point. Um, and we have such a successful school system because everybody does work together so well on behalf of the kids. So have a great summer. Ms. Schultz? Um, I wanna thank the people that made the graduations possible. Um, who we never really see, um, all the AV, all the facilities, all of the support staff that are behind the scenes, because all of the people out front, we sit on stage, but we sit on the stage that they build. Um, we talk into mics that they uh, put together. Um, we watch on screens that um, they, uh, they produce the film for. Um, they move in and out. Um, they turned three graduations at Eagle Bank um, Arena. We had one graduation that ran really long, and I think everybody was sweating about whether or not that we could uh, uh, do the flip turn. And every single time that I showed up at one of those graduations, all that support staff was there, and they don't get the highlight. So I want to thank them for moving trucks and podiums and chairs and and banners and everything and making each graduation look and feel special. Um, I also wanna um, say thanks to my, um, my father, 
of who is sitting at home of my children um, and wish him a happy Father's Day in advance and that we are now officially, Tom Wilson and I, are the only two parents of Fairfax County Public Schools left on this board. Uh, also, uh, I want to uh, congratulate all of our graduates. This really is my favorite time of year. Um, I was honored to attend the graduations at Key Center, Bryant, Mount Vernon, Edison, Lee, and Hayfield. Congratulations to all of our graduates. Um, it is, uh, since I have two uh, bird schools, uh, hawks and eagles, we always say it's your time to soar. So um, I, I do uh, want you to uh, know that we will miss you and we hope we have served you well and we wish you all the best. Tomorrow is the last day of school for all of our students. Um, take this time to relax, recharge, read a little. You deserve this break and um, really enjoy it with family and friends. Um, I too want to uh, say I enjoyed um, attending with Ms. Corbett Sanders, the Becoming One Fairfax um, uh, event uh, yesterday. And also congratulations, Ms. Strauss, again. Um, the Cappies is always a wonderful event and you work so hard to put it together. So thank you for continuing your hard work on that. It is a, a beautiful event. And happy Father's Day to everyone this Sunday. Ms. Corbett Sanders. I'm sorry. Ms. Keys Gamara, it's late. I thought, oh, I, got, I still have time. Jimmy Karen's. <laughs> well, so many people have reminded me of where I've been, so I won't repeat. <laughs> um, but um, I do want to say happy Father's Day. My dad is here. Um, he's 86, and I will be, I'll be making him something special on Sunday, along with all the other men that live in my household. Um, um, but I'm grateful um, to have been able to have office hours. I had 25 people show up to that. I had some wonderful discussions. Two, scheduled for two hours. I stayed for three, but it's, it's fine. Um, was able to do the FCPS honors. I was um, impressed with that. The Cappies were wonderful. That was my, there's so many firsts that I've had. This is my first student representative. I will never forget her. Um, and, you know, I started at the top, so the next person's going to have a hard time. This, she's a hard act to follow, so I just want to congratulate you. Um, and, you know, I just want to wish everybody a happy summer. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, I did go to, that nobody else mentioned, the, the Chantilly Pyramid Minority Awards. I was there with Mr. Mr. Moon, and as usual, um, we are just impressed. And the more I see our young people, the more and the more encouraged I am that despite the many things that we, the difficulties that we are faced, our our young people are ready for the challenge. So I want them to enjoy their summer. Um, I appreciate all the people who came out tonight. Some of these discussions are very, very difficult to have. And I uh, truly believe that everybody is trying to do the right thing, even the folks that I don't necessarily agree with. So I just say uh, kudos to our community because um, we are listening. We care about our kids. We're all fighting for the same thing. So everybody enjoy the summer. Thank you. Good night. Ms. Fedicata, since you stayed all the way through, would you like a few more words? <laughs> Actually, mostly good. I just wanted to have the chance to stay to the end of the meeting because I know that with exams and all, I haven't been able to stay for all the meetings I so know. far. But thank you all for having me this year. It's been an incredible learning opportunity. It's gotten me interested in government, which is what I'm hoping to study in college. So thank you for that. Great. And with all of that, this meeting is adjourned.